If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this fabulous episode of Mind Pump, Pump. Where are we it's at? Super fabulous. We're in. Uh, Where's this place called? Paso Paso, Paso Robles. Paso Robles. 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 Beautiful, beautiful uh, scenery out here. It's like a winer. Is this like a like a place where wineries are? Would you shit? say? Uh, wh- wh- where would you rank the house for you? The house because this Ooh, is compared to all this, of them. Yeah, all of them. Oh no, I don't. This think... has one of the best views. Yeah, the, one of the best views for sure. Yeah, okay. I like the one in Holly uh, the Hills. I like the Tahoe yeah. one, but it's it's a nice place. But yeah, a nice yeah, yeah. fireplace. Anyways, yes, it's very, very nice. Anyway, for the first fifty minutes of our introductory. Current events conversation. We covered Eric Lundgren. He's actually a gentleman who's hacking into cars, making them last longer, and he might even go to jail over it. No, it's the computers. Yeah, He's computers. coming up with the chips yeah, for computers. Yeah, Something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Pretty close. The computers of cars yeah. to make them last longer. Yeah, he turned no, he turned them no. into he actually uh, took old pieces old parts from computers and made a car. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah that's where the car part well, came Well, learn, learn, learn what we really <laughs> talked about in this episode. We talked about the evolution of our style. I'm the most consistent. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> you definitely have that down. We talk about men and crying. Justin gets real deep on that one. Man, I was blubbering. We talk about communication skills, Putin's new nuclear toys, or as Adam says it, Putin's new nuclear toys. Look out for Sal's good transitions nuclear. in this one. Yeah. We talk about finger piercing and tattoo trends, training frequency, muscle soreness, muscle adaptation, and we also mentioned two of our sponsors. Adam had the Four Sigmatic Reishi last night, and it got him tucked into bed, and he slept really nice. Now, we are sponsored by Four Sigmatic. He's a good boy. He drank it. If you go to Four Sigmatic, spelled F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash mind pump, and enter the code mind pump, you'll get a discount. We also mentioned Thrive Market. Doug is going to be uh, cooking up a Thai cuisine for us tonight uh, with ingredients bought off of Thrive Market, organic, non-GMO products. Ooh, I can almost smell it. If you go to thrivemarket.com forward slash mind pump, here's what you'll get. One month free membership. And twenty dollars off your first three orders of forty nine dollars more, and that's not all. You'll also get free shipping. Also, by the way, before I get into the questions, don't forget if you go to mindpumpmedia.com, you can see all of our show notes, so you can kind of go down and see what point of the episode we talked about a specific thing. The first question we answered was: Is sex needed for optimal health, or is it better? To not have sex. So we asked Justin. He seems to be having most sex. Yeah, man. That was a lie. Yeah. Next <laughs> question. <laughs> Just slaying it. Next question. <laughs> Where do we see the future of personal training? Actually, a great conversation on that question right there. Next question was, what are our thoughts on necessary nutrition for children and the best way to teach them about eating healthy? Also a good conversation there. Do you spank them when they eat an Oreo? Wow. Probably not. Yeah, that's not the move. Final question. How do we weigh out huge decisions? Do we have any advice for people who are facing a huge life decision? Again, this episode, we get pretty deep. It's pretty entertaining. Also, would you like to get into our forum for free? What do you say? That's right. You can actually get free access to our forum for enrolling in any of our MAPS bundles. Bundles are when we put MAPS programs together. Let me go through and give you a quick rundown. Are you interested in building maximum muscle and strength? MAPS Anabolic is for you. Are you inter- interested in functional performance, almost like an athlete? Ooh, I like that. MAPS Performance is for you. Are you interested in sculpting and shaping your body or even competing on a stage like a bodybuilder, a physique competitor, or a bikini competitor? Then get MAPS Aesthetic. That sounds like me. Do you like to work out on the go without fitness equipment? You like to exercise with just your body weight? Anywhere. Try MAPS anywhere. I love it. Do you have pain in your body? Do you want to correct imbalances? Do you want to move better so you can do your heavy lifts without pain? Sometimes I hurt. Well, that's the MAPS Prime and Prime Pro bundle. If you get any bundle, don't forget you get free access to a forum. For more information, go to mindpumpmedia.com. Sal, do you guys do either, or Justin, do either one of you guys know who Eric Lundgren is? No. You never heard that name? No. I'm like, I, so I was reading in the hustle uh, yesterday. Whoa, his name sounds familiar. I, you sh- I would think you both know it. I, I, I didn't know who it was, and I feel like I should know who this guy is because he sounds fucking brilliant. He uh, is like an e-waste recycling pioneer. Like he, he mm. was one of the people that started to see how fast we we're turning through these electronics and mm. that it was like going to be a problem. And then he's, 
supposed to be really brilliant. Like he's taken some of these computer parts and he's actually made a car out of it that can go further than a Tesla <laughs> uh, on electricity, right? So, really? Yeah, wow. yeah. So he's supposed to be really brilliant. And so check this out. This is what he does. So in 2011, he's been back and forth, I guess, in this big lawsuit. 2011, he uh, creates a, I guess it's like a, a disc or a chip that uh, it increases the longevity of your current computer. So basically, I think it like updates it to whatever. So he ha he's hacking yes. into. So he's hacking it. He's hacking yeah, it. Because yeah, yeah. you know how well, your computer is just obsolete in five years, yeah, 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 yeah. right? Oh, yeah. And you're and then you're into the next thing. Well, he's right. found a chip to expand the life, basically, of these of these Microsoft computers. And so guess what? Microsoft is coming oh, after. they're pissed. Oh, for sure. They want, yeah, they want you to, to upgrade to the newest thing. And that's why they, I swear, dude, they, they have it built in to uh, go to a certain amount of time to where everything's going to start to degrade there's not there is no like this is like wear this and is the, tear. Be, this is funny to me because p especially for technology patents, bro they're trying to, they're trying to a, they're trying to put him in jail and shit over this I, 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 this so this is he's infringing on patents and patent laws and mm -hmm. protectionist laws which you know whether you agree with them or not i think is doesn't matter i good luck like this is a program. How are you going to stop this? People jailbreak their phones all the time. That's illegal too. Like yeah. once stuff like this and technology gets free, which obviously if he created it, it's not. Yes, he's a smart guy, but at some point it'll be as easy as going on your computer and downloading it to something and then uploading. That's it That's crazy. Because every time I swear I update after like Apple comes out with a new product and I update my phone or my computer or whatever, I swear like the speed goes way down. It does. No, no, no. They, they came out with a statement and said that that's what they and do. And they do that. So the reason why they do it is they say it's to save your battery life because oh. the new updates. Oh, bullshit. Yes. That's exactly. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That's what I think. Dude, they're planned like three, yeah. four generations yeah. down, dude. Yeah. yeah. yeah and yeah, everything, yeah. all the computers, all the We're computers, but here's, all that. Here's the thing with that though, Justin, like that's perfectly fine in my, in my. Yeah. I just don't update. It. Be, so for me, that's perfectly fine. They have the right to choose. do that, but then somebody else has the right to potentially put something there. You out. go. You know what you I'm change saying? It, yeah. or, or you just buy something different. But as far as this guy getting in trouble for doing what he's doing under current law, yeah, he has broken the law, but these. This is all posturing. Like they're trying to make an example out of people like him, but good luck stopping anybody else from doing that. Like patents are going to be so completely worthless at some point. Yeah. It's not going to be funny. I can't believe I didn't know who this was. Clamoring to, you know, these old ownership of all these different things. It's it's funny. Like they're scrambling now trying the, to figure it out. Because the old model is just completely it's going to change so much. What are you going to do? Yeah. When you, do you do you guys remember anybody who before like Napster? Like, what was the first big big thing like that? Oh yeah. Before Napster? Yeah. Well, we used to steal cable. You know, you do the black box. All oh, right. That. That's right. Like pay per view. Yeah. yeah. You could you could jack into your neighbors. Remember that shit? <laughs> uh, yeah. What else were people doing? I mean, people would go into cam into movie theaters and like camcorder. Yeah. You know, but yeah. nobody really cared about Pirating. that because because the, the quality was so bad. You know, right, right. Where now you could just get the same exact quality, no problem. Right. I'm trying to. I wish. I, I wonder. If, you know, my audience. They, I love. By Every the way, time I go I, to Mexico, I love buy that. some knockoff shit. Do you? Yeah. <laughs> you come back and you're like, these aren't Oakleys. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> these are Folkleys. Did you know how much they, those cost? Okay. So when I was a kid, uh, I was in let's see here fourth grade, and I'm I was trying to think of what made me into Oakley glasses that much. But I liked Oakley so much. That's when they had the, the razor blade sides. You know, yeah. Oh, my God. And then, like, the tent, the <laughs> oh, different. Man. And you, you could you the razor ones? Oh, yeah. And you could. Uh, I mean, this is fourth grade, bro. This is yeah. way back. That shit yeah. was cool then. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah, totally. And I saved the whole summer up to buy a pair. And they were like $120 or $140 back then, which is like $500 or yeah, $1,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. for glasses now, right? So I yeah. saved up for these glasses as a kid. And that was when chums were popular. So you put the chums. Oh, my God. Oh, my. Chums, the right? croakies. Yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You yeah. put those on. Oh, man. That's crazy. What? I don't know why i was just telling you that <laughs> <laughs> the best was was the ones like you remember um was it michael jackson had the ones where it like kind of was like a web that went down you know from here like they're bright red and then they had like a webbing yes. around the sides you oh that's those? what i was telling you guys those things cost 23 cents to make that's crazy what it's just plastic yeah. and then yeah they, they well, were the, well the, co the cost of the the cost of the product is not based on the cost of like the cost the consumer pays is partially based on how much I, what, it makes cost my, to make them. My but, point of make, my point of that is that we're going to be able to make things like that for for next to nothing. Right, You'll be able to jack right. in your. It's just plastic. Well, like how the, easy would it be to get that raw materials here in the next ten years? So think of it this way, because I thought about that for a second, right? When it comes to fashion, fashion may be protected a little bit because 
people don't necessarily buy the expensive fashion because it looks better. It used to be that way, but it's really more so because they want to they want people to know it's authentic. Yeah. Like it's real and I right. paid this much for it. So okay. Fa- so I think what they're going to have to do Fashion is a way for you to express yourself. Right. So that'll never I agree with that. Well, that'll so never, I, that'll, I, that'll, We'll still find a way to make that expensive. Or <laughs> well, that's what I was say. What do you think about this? Like, I feel like fashion makers will just figure out creative ways to. Well, I think we like maybe they'll do like a special. Well, look at I'll, I'll show you know. how we do it. Here's an example of it right now. Do you do you guys know? You've seen my shoes that I have from from Kikasso. So this is you're watching this stuff be become really popular. Someone like Taylor, that's a purist with shoes, hates that and doesn't like that. But I see the future of that of like even fashion being so unique. Yeah. Like an artist does artwork on it's like your, the West Coast customs of shoes. Because if you think of the three D yeah. printing future, like you're saying, like we're gonna be able to print off not the best, coolest looking Nikes. I can just print them off. But what I can't, not everybody can do, is have somebody put their touch to it. On something that's like represents me, so like I'm, I'm, you know, like Justin, I'm into Star Wars, so I have some sort of like a piece of art on there mm-hmm. that's represents Star Wars, and so I think things like that, because we'll all be able to make the the models of our shoes, and look how yeah. we're doing, how you see it's Nike. more like licensing out, yeah, your brand. Look where Nike, Nike, Nike went with a Nike ID. Yeah, Nike ID was the beginning of that. Yeah, I now love you've that seen they it, did that, and now it's it's getting more and more popular for you to customize it yeah. all yourself. So yeah, it'll be like that. You know, what I'm saying everyone will be able to have a base model, and then you'll you'll seek out this, build on it. Yeah, yeah this. maybe. Or the other thing could be that people just personalize and make their own shit. You know what I mean? They'll be still have such tools for for doing these things that the people it'll be maybe in style to not. Yeah, but that's like creative people. Oh, I, I, you know, what I, mean? I don't think everybody's that creative. Right? Like, they just want to fucking buy something. They don't don't have like yeah. an idea. They'll be that side too, Sal. Yeah. Just like there is now. Or it'll be like in those dystopian. M- I mean, did movie, you, movies did, where everybody's wearing like the same thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> did you guys like, ah, sacks. fuck it? Yeah. Did you, just, uh, Justin? Would, did either one of you guys ever go through a phase where I went through a phase where I wore like white t-shirts for like only like two years and dude. dark jeans and, and white t-shirts. Just, yeah. Fucking white Hanes T-shirt V-necks, dude. Like oh, I used to wear white. I used to wear white beaters all the time. Phase. I had. I literally bought like thirty of them, and I just just rotated. But that was when I thought I was like all like rockabilly and shit, and I would like cuff my pants, you yeah. know, and I'd wear my white shirt and then grease my hair every day. Same yes. exact thing. So handsome. how long did you do yeah. that for? How many girls probably did you get doing at that? At least probably like a year and a half, dude. I, you know what I'm Straight. curious? How much has your style actually evolved and changed since high school? My style? Yeah. Has it changed much? You know, I mean, I'm trying to think of things that I actually were important to me with style. Um, I used to wear wife beaters a lot. I had leather jackets. You <laughs> used to. Yeah. I still do. You were working out in a wife beater uh, this like, morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never seen you not yeah. wear a wife beater. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean. That was so great. I mean, that literally was like just, tattooed on you your body. You just gave yourself up so <laughs> tattooed, hard. Tattooed. <laughs> I want you to tattoo a wife beater all over your body. <laughs> It's a part of amazing, me. dude. <laughs> no, I, I uh, yeah, I don't think it's ever been important to me. It's not something that I'm really super focused on. I've definitely been like, if I was going to go out with a girl or whatever, would try and look a certain way, but I really never really cared. Well, you look sharp. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that I'm, I'm curious. What I mean is that I, 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 didn't put, I never put it's thought simple. into it. Yeah, I never simple. really put thought into it. Like think to myself, uh, like, oh, I'm going to. There were times when I was a kid where so you never went through that as a kid where you felt like you wanted to like wanted it something as your friend was Jenko wearing jeans okay, at one you remember, point. Remember, you right. know, uh, <laughs> there was that whole junior high phase where that, you really wanted hardcore. Did you hacky sack? Yeah, I was like, just gonna hardcore say hardcore hacky the, sack. Yeah, bro. no, no, I didn't. You hacky have sack. to hacky sack wearing those fucking balloon. No, jeans. No, I never did. Oh, you know, wow. it was it, there was like a period of time between twelve and I'll say maybe fourteen or fifteen. Where you're like, you're just trying to fit in, you know what I mean? So you, you kind of see what other people wear. Right. But then after that, I started, it was, I really stopped caring, that, you know? So I was just like, whatever. You know, I was this this past weekend and we were talking about this. I, I, I was forced to be creative with like my outfit because yeah. we couldn't, we didn't. I got a box like every year from my grandmother that my sister and I, okay, my 50 year old grandmother's picking my outfits out. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh my God. She's picking my clothes out, which I appreciate and I love my grandma for that. But I had like all the knockoff like Nike stuff. It'd be, it'd be like a Nike swoosh, but then inside it'd be hang, <laughs> at the hang stack. It's like the swoosh is upside down. No, they were. I had, no way. Yeah, I had like a visor. It was backwards. You know what I'm saying? But people didn't pick up on it. You know what I'm That's saying? That's hilarious. Oh, yeah. So I had shit like that. So I remember I remember early on uh, being teased for like my outfits. And then I – so I think that it, it thickened my skin and built this strong character around that to where – I was like, I'm gonna own it. You know, what I'm saying, I, I, there, did it I hurt your feelings at first? No, I, it, I thought I was trying to think back to that. Like, I don't remember it. Well, how did it thicken your skin? What do well, you mean? here's the thing that tripped me out too. So, something that we we broke through this last weekend was, so we were telling stories uh, about my sister, and I for, I forget exactly how we got there, 
but I started to say something about my sister, and I, this is where I started to cry. It was, it was a trip because, I hadn't, first of all, I don't ever cry. And I started to get choked up about it. I've only it. seen you cry like four or five times. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty low. But yeah. what, what tripped me <laughs> that out. That time I got you in a headlock was yeah. one of them. What, what, tripped, me, what tripped me out <laughs> was onions. Anatone was like, he's like, he's all, it's okay, dude. Well, tell me, is it was this hard or sad? And I was like, no, bro, it's, uh, this is a joy, right? It was actually, I was talking about something that my sister had said to me about me, and it made me feel really good. And I, and I, then I start that made me go even deeper and go, you know, it's a trip. So I didn't even cry at my dad's funeral. And so from that point, point on, I can't tell you a time that I've ever cried in my life over being sad. Every time I've been emotional, whether I've cried, it's a bit out of joy, joy and happened, excitement. Yeah. Huh. So I, and I was like, oh, that was a trip. That was a connection that I made that I never even thought of until he made me get emotional over something and then he asked me thought I was maybe sad over something I was like no no you know that's actually um, quite common among men because we uh, as we grow up and get older and whatever we know that crying is like socially unacceptable or you know you're made fun of and it's always attached to don't be a wimp you know be strong or whatever so it's always attached to pain right so I think we have learned as men to uh, so to, for to na- not cry for that, but then when you all of a sudden get super happy and don't right. know what to do, like you don't know how to deal with that, and then the emotion kind of comes out yeah, a little yeah. bit. That's what I really think it is, because I'm the exact well, same way. So think of that. So think of that if if men naturally kind of have that in them already, and then my father takes his life at seven years old. Oh, it makes it worse, right? And then I and then I don't cry. Well, also then, probably because I can't even imagine as the, a child because yeah. you were seven, right? Right, and I'm the oldest. Like how you're yeah. dealing with right. it. Yeah, not right. So it out. you probably felt. Did anybody tell you, or did you automatically? feel this did anybody come up to you and say okay well you're the man of the house now or did you automatically feel that because you were the oh oldest? i automatically felt that right away so right yeah. and now now you're seven now imagine this your seven-year-old self feeling now that you are the man of the house your seven-year-old understanding of what that meant right is what you like an immediate like switch went off like, like you okay, like what, whatever you under, what right, you understand everything. as a seven-year-old right. now you're like this is what a man is and I'm sure crying right. is not how much part of that. Imagine how much it's cemented into my mind now over all this time, too. You know, I'm 37 years old. Think of all of those oh, years. Yeah. So that, I thought that was really cool that we made that connection mm. that I had never even thought about that before. And yeah. I was like, oh, shit, that's a trip. You know, that yeah. type of stuff. Yeah. I can't remember. I, I I can't remember the last time I cried over something really sad. Yeah. Like the, either. That's very difficult. I didn't cry. Sad. Dude, I didn't cry when I got divorced. Mm. at all through the whole process I didn't and it was very tough that was one of the hardest thing I've ever gone through oh yeah well I cry. I did cry when my when someone very close to me died of cancer but it was what they said to me that made me cry and she told me um, you know don't feel bad you, you, you did help me you really tried your best and then I was like Ugh. and so I don't oh, know if that's yeah. necessarily sadness or like I failed yeah. you know that I kind of lost it but I don't but it wasn't like a sob like I've never sobbed don't you sometimes feel like you like? I wonder if you're missing something because you haven't done that. It's all uh, yeah. stored up like inside you. Just you. completely let it out, dude. I told you about the time I saw. Um, if you guys, when's the last time you've heard a grown man actually cr- like cry, cry? Like, when's the last time you heard that? I'm not <sighs> 22 years old, somewhere around there. I don't know. I think I heard it and I ran away. It's a, it's a, it's a weird thing yeah, to it's, hear. It's like yeah, <clears throat> because you're not used to it, and I feel like when a man loses it in that direction, then it's like because <clears throat> uh, I heard it. Dude, there was a guy that worked for in my facility who he was going through some really terrible shit with his wife, and one of the female trainers one goes up to him and she's his friend and she starts hugging him, mm-hmm. and and you can see him kind of like he's really sad, so his arms right aside, he won't even like put his arms around her, and she keeps rubbing his back and she's like, "Listen, it's okay. You can like you can let it out. It's okay." Oh, she Robin Williams, him, dude. Huh? And then he went, <laughs> yeah, it's "Totally, she, it's not your fault." And not then your fault. you see his face change, like he starts crying quietly. But then he started like, so it starts with the lip, like kind of quivering. Bro, then he started the, ah, yeah. Yeah. Ah, it was really like, and oh like, no, snot bubbles. And everything. What do you do? I don't know. <laughs> That's the only time I've cried is like when somebody somebody is like really crying like and i'm just like sitting there and then it like starts to affect me you know <laughs> like it's contagious or something i just can't help it man like i just i feel energy from other people more than I, like i don't think to do it but like somebody can affect me like that's that the, like that's, easy that's the the mark of a good of a natural communicator so there's there's there are neurons in the brain called mirror neurons have you heard of these hmm. so if i if i'm have if i'm doing something Let's say I have an emotion, my own original emotion, or I do a movement, or I throw a basketball or something like that. 
there's neurons that fire that pattern yeah. that show that I'm doing that. Now, if I watch someone else doing that exact same thing, those neurons still fire. Yeah. The only difference is I'm not getting the physical feedback from my body from actually performing it. So mm-hmm. when you're watching someone have an emotion, smile, cry, whatever, your mirror neurons go off oh, and yeah. you, that, or that literally tell you that you're experiencing the same thing. That's how social yeah. humans, that's why we're so interconnected. That's, why, that's, that's our whole body language. Dude, I mean, that's why when you, up on it. when you see when you see people that are great communicators, not only can they com- communicate verbally, but they're also they're animated and they smile. Dude, and they, they, we, that's such an important piece to communication. The most important yeah. part of communication is not speaking; it's listening. Right. And listening is not just hearing the words; it's actually feeling what the person is trying to convey. Here's Being the deal: being engaged. Here's the thing: if you if you're trying to communicate to somebody and you fully grasp and understand what they're trying to communicate and their emotional state behind their communication, now you know how to reply and communicate back to them. If you don't understand that, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. You're guessing at best. At best, you're guessing. And you can be a good good salesperson and sell your idea or whatever, or at least animate it and make it really charismatic or whatever. But if you don't fully understand the other person, then you're kind of guessing and you're really playing with, you know, half power or not even. Mm -hmm. So listen, I remember learning that as a, as a, as a salesperson, one of the most uh, uh, impactful lessons I ever learned was early on in my sales career, in my career in fitness, I was really effective at selling training right out the gates. But I remember sitting next to, uh, at the time, one of my mentors who had been doing it a little longer than me. And he was also very, very good. And he was doing the process or whatever. And me and him are doing like, we're, we're talking to a potential customer together and after the customer left, he looked at me and he said, use your ears and your mouth in proportion. I said, what, is, what, what does that mean? He goes, listen twice as much as you talk. Many times when you listen, you're going to get everything you need to make to be a much more effective communicator. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that that's weird. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense or not. But I just started doing it and I started realizing like, oh shit, I'm way better. Yeah. When I listen more than right. than I talk, and that's that's what it really that's really what it amounts oh, to. Oh, part of the sales process that I used to teach trainers was to to like if someone to answer a question. My challenge before even trying to think of money and sales and converting things like that, like learn to be a- an active listener, learn to be engage in the conversation. And so when you ask a question, don't just stay right there. Like go three more questions within that question. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So if I ask you something very basic, like Sal, what's your goal? And yeah, you say fat loss. Right. I got to dig deeper into yeah. that. What How makes, do you mean? Right. Yeah. How much? Right. Yeah, exactly. All and, those different things. And when you and when you do that, it does. It makes that other person feel feel like you're mm-hmm. engaged in the conversation. By, by the way, how do you mm-hmm. mean is a is a is a magical uh, yeah. statement in yeah. communication. Right. If you want someone to go deeper, uh, all you got to say is how do you mean? For whatever reason, it is not offense. If I say what do you mean? How Sometimes mean? it's a little abrasive. Like mm-hmm. if you're explaining something, I'm like, what mm-hmm. do you mean? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like people feel accused. But if I say, how do you mean? It's, it comes across very much like I'm trying to yeah. understand you. And right. boy, do people open up. There was another technique that I've really started to utilize recently that I learned from Jordan Peterson, who's obviously, he's a psychologist. And so when a, when a very, very good psychologist teaches you how to listen uh, or talks about listening to people, that's a good time to pay attention because that's what they do. That's what their, their job is, especially if they're good, right? So one thing that he said that was, I was like, oh, that's fucking brilliant, is when someone's explaining something to you, repeat it back to them. Yeah. So what, if you're explaining something to me, then I'll say, okay, let me let me see if I understand what you're saying. What you're, mm-hmm. what you're saying is, and try to distill what they're saying into something that's understandable. Right. Now that sounds easy, but it's actually quite difficult because you'll go back and forth right. many times, many times because you either didn't understand them or because the person communicating is thinking out as they're talking they're trying to formulate what they're trying to express themselves Mm -hmm. but when you can distill it down to what they mean and you both agree after you've communicated it now you can communicate your point extremely effective i i I heard him i wrote i read that when he wrote that and i was like well that's fucking brilliant and i've actually used it a couple times and uh you know i've gotten a couple well that takes good communication with both parties because like you can do that and then a lot of times like people's egos if they don't understand what you're saying but then they just immediately agree with what you're saying because they don't really they feel like afraid to Mm -hmm. to say well i don't necessarily understand what you just said there like can we talk about that a little bit more well that's what makes humans so uh, dynamic um and remarkable and uh, and especially in our growth and how fast we evolve our thought process and the way we live and and things tend to get much, much better in most uh, metrics is that our ability to 
communicate with each other and that extends to you know writing things down and storing them so now we have stored knowledge that we can add upon and it also comes to i mean the better animals can communicate the more social they become and the larger their societies become this is true for all animals whether you look at chimpanzees or or, or dolphins or humans who are the greatest communicators you know, in the world, our ability to be able to c- convey ideas. We're number one. Is, yeah, our ability to convey are ideas. Are we, though? Are we? <laughs> I mean, that's what we think. Yeah. I mean, how do we know that? Are octopuses, you know, like having deep conversations? Right. And well, right. so, yeah. right. so. And they don't even they need to be, be. They don't even need to be near each they're other. They're just tingly <laughs> well, suckers. Well, here's <laughs> well, here's the part that they lack uh, because they do communicate pretty I well. I agree with you. Things. I'm just fucking with you. Though. Well, and, <laughs> like, you got to think, well, think about that a little bit. Right? Well, colonies communicate uh, in incredibly remarkable ways so that they all work as one unit. And you get what's I called mean, the jelly, mind. I mean, the jellyfish lives oh, forever. So I feel like maybe they got something that we Or bees. Yeah, but that's, I mean, that's almost like on a chemical level. Well, that's what I'm saying. It's just a form of communication, right? Yeah. But here's the difference between that. The difference between uh, us and, and other animals like ants or whatever, because they do have, in some respects, incredible communication, is that humans have the ability to uh, to store knowledge and then to add on to it. So ants haven't evolved in their processes right. that much in millions and millions of years, whereas humans have this, you know, this this hockey stick of evolution where – we not a lot changed for a long time. There were some advancements, not much. But then when we got the ability to like store information, it was like whoosh, now we explode in our ability to grow and evolve, where we can become more and more specialized as a result. So, yeah. So I I find communication fascinating, and I think the better you can you can do it as a person, the more effective you'll be you'll be in your whole life. Everything, relationships, your job. I don't care what work do you do. Are you That's kidding? an important aspect. I, I mean, I, I think it's, I tell every, I don't care what fucking job you have. That has to be one of the most important things that you can learn to do for sure. I think that should be taught at very young age all the way through school. That should be like a staple class, the way we've treated some other classes that I think are pretty useless. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that rules should be uh, established or at least people should understand how a good argument or a good debate is made so that we don't get so caught up in the... <laughs> You know, like uh, like a, here's a simple, silly, simple example. It would solve a lot of people's problems when they're trying to argue or, or debate with someone. If I'm having an argument with Justin over a specific topic, and Justin does a, you know, he creates a straw man for me to focus on. We've lost the the central focus of the conversation, so no progress can be made because now yeah. we're sidetracked with all these different straw men that really don't have anything to do. With the topic at hand, you got to explain what straw man is for exactly. people that don't explain. know what straw man. Is. So a straw man would be just creating a separate argument that really has nothing to do with. So, for example, if I say to you, um, you know, well, you know, uh, Trump has made a Trump made a bad decision on foreign policy, uh, you know, and I'm a liberal, right? Trump made a bad decision on for some foreign policy, and then you come at me, you'd be like, well, Obama made the same decision. What the fuck does that have to do with what I just said? Other than <laughs> yeah. now we're going to argue who's it's pol- like a diversion tactic. It's it, it really it's nothing has nothing to do with with what we're discussing at all. It's just it's distracting me from what we're talking about. There's a lot of different uh, uh, you know ways of debating. A, a, a more discussion. extreme version would that be someone attacking you personally? Either oh, that's uh, and yeah. that's called something else. I forgot what that's called, but um, there's a lot of terminology and, and just knowing how to how to debate and discuss. Be like let's focus on the topic at hand. Let's discuss discuss this. Yeah, and you're right. Attacking someone personally also is another kind of not fair and not really effective. You know, it's interesting. You guys are talking about like school. Like I remember in college, we actually had a class um, where we would have a panel. Like basically our project was to argue and debate a point that they would just assign you. And so a lot of times you got the one that um, like you didn't agree with necessarily, but you had to kind of build up your your case and you had to like write all these points out and make sure that it was a powerful case that you're presenting against the, the counter argument. And uh, I remember getting one for, I had to like uh, argue uh, for having nuclear power and nuclear um, uh, uh, warheads. Hmm. So I had to like argue and basically you know, obviously my argument was really just that uh, we got, um, you know, to this certain level. So that way now we've prevented wars because um, with nuclear warheads, it's like a deterrent. You know, it's like the ultimate, uh, basically we all go down, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but anyways, it's just like, it was interesting because it, it gets people to think 
um, in in a different direction, and it no, kind of forces them. It's a good. It's a good. It's a good practice right away to to learn to argue the opposite. Are side. you kidding? That's because what. That's all. It, I do that all day long. It teaches you. It. it teaches you empathy when someone yeah. else is debating you about a topic. Like well, the first thing, as soon as someone, like I'm not. I think there's a mistake a lot of people make when they get into debates or conversation is they're thinking of their next point versus trying to actually listen to the other person right. and, and understand where they're coming from. That's right. Like that. And so doing stuff like that helps you understand where somebody else could be coming from because you've actually had to think, okay, if I had to argue and defend this, mm-hmm. what are all the angles or ways I had to think? Well, that helps you have empathy for that person who's now debating that on that side. I think it's so, that's well, such an important skill. Well, I mean, you, you, here's the deal when it comes to, uh, you know, God, I forgot where I was going with this. <laughs> you said empathy for someone. I totally forgot. No, it is. It's, it's just, it's super important that people learn to do that. I, okay. That's a skill set that, I mean, I feel like I've been practicing for a very, very oh, here, long time. Here is where I was going to go, if you don't mind me interrupting. You just pulled so, a Justin right yeah, there. Yeah, I know. I just did a Justin right Man. there. What happened? Wow. We shouldn't. We hung out too much last night. <laughs> I'm affecting you just yeah. like you're affecting no, my gut. So here's the deal. You, if, if, you, if you just want – if you're so afraid of being wrong – that you avoid looking at the other side because like you almost don't want to know. You, you just want to be right so bad that you don't want to know. But the reality is, do you want to be right in the sense that you have the right answer or do you just want to win is my point. Yeah. So if you want to truly be right, you have to study and examine the opposite side with as much detail and as much dedication oh, as yeah. to the side you, you subscribe to. You have to critically to. think your way through that. And one of two things is going to happen. One is... You're going to realize that you're wrong, but that's great because that means you're no longer wrong. So that's awesome. But people are afraid of that because then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I've been wrong this whole time and, and that's too painful. It, uh. It's more painful to continue to being wrong. So that just, just realize that. And the second thing is when you, if you study the other side and you realize that you're still right, you've only strengthened your position even further. Yep. You know what I'm saying? So you're just create, you're getting more evidence by being as open, as honest as possible. I do that shit. If I'm debating someone on economics... Nine, I tell you something right now. Nine out of ten times, I can argue their side better than right. they can, and I can still overcome it. But I can still argue their side better. And you see a lot of the same arguments circulating over and over again because people haven't realized that uh, because it worked on people who didn't know their side. Once you start to debate a side and you start to realize, oh, that's not a, actually that's a, a poor argument, then you start to strengthen your own. So it's yeah. very important that you do that. Yeah, you know, for sure. Very, very important. Did you guys see oh. the, uh, Russia's announcements uh, uh, on their nuclear? Their new nuclear. Oh, speaking of nuclear, yeah, right? Nu- that yeah. would have been a much better transition. Why bro? didn't yeah. you do that? I he set was talking you up perfectly. Yeah, that yeah. was. He's yeah, talking about nuclear. Yeah, Why wouldn't you start right God. there instead of forgetting your train Nucle- of thought? Nuclear. One of these times, Sal. One of these yeah, times. Yeah, nuclear. Isn't that what it is? Nuclear. It'll be smooth. So uh, he. So Russia has got apparently. Uh, Putin came out and talked about their new nuclear capabilities, their new weapons that they have. Um, awesome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not so, scary at all. So one of his uh, ICBMs is called the, the Satan II. I don't know if you guys knew that. That's the nickname for it. Get the fuck out of here. No joke. Wow. And this is an so it's an ICBM. Those are intercontinental, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. That means that they can launch them from Russia and they'll hit any country or anywhere in the world, right? And we've had these for a long time. These have uh. been around since the since the nineteen. Yeah, but we got the Patriot missile. Seventies and eighties, right? Well, here's the deal. Um, they've designed one that uh, flies at hypersonic speeds in strange maneuvers. That now they're showing examples, and American strategists are saying, "Oh yeah, that that would be almost impossible to shoot down oh, with our current capabilities." So cool. there's that. So that that came out. He also has a uh, a, a sub that is autonomous. So it's an uh, it's total self driving sub. It's a nuclear sub that's nuclear powered. In other words, this thing goes underwater and can be out in the ocean for like a hundred years or more oh and park God. itself. What? Park itself somewhere in the ocean. So it could be in the ocean. It could sit there, turn itself off, or run at low whatever nuclear powered and chill in case some shit goes down. So they've got one of those, which I'm sure those have been around for a while. I'm sure we probably have those too. Yeah. Um, and then there's also a nuclear powered cruise missile so this is a, a missile that goes up into space probably and can just circle the globe forever he's with just, a nuke on it straight up peacocking right yeah. now just, ah. so so essentially what this is just a, this is just ensuring mutual destruction oh, that's all it's doing it's just keeping the balance in the force yeah, i guess yeah <laughs> no he's just he's trying to like put his chips out there like boom yeah this Dude, is what I got. It's got to end at one point, though, right? Like, how do you how do you get more powerful in that sense, right? 
I don't understand how where, there's, where it there's, ends. There's nothing. Oh, I, I, we'll, we'll have a death. I rate. can now blow the world up seven yeah. times over. I mean, is that there's what? nothing? I, I think the the biggest advantage would be if somebody invented a way to completely neutralize all incoming missiles. That would be a huge power shift. But other than that, I, I, I you know, here's the thing. Like a lot of people don't realize this. If the Soviet Union and the U.S. didn't have nukes when the Cold War was going on, we would have gone to war for sure. Uh-huh. 100% we would have gone to war. We almost went to war with nukes. Yeah. You know, several times. People no, don't realize totally how close deterrent. we came to, you know, mutually assured self-destruction on you know, both sides, on all sides, right? But we didn't because of that. It was like the biggest deterrent. That's why Pakistan and India don't go to wars because they've yeah. got nukes pointed at each other. And it's like, who's going to pull the trigger first? It doesn't matter. Everybody dies. It'd be like It would be like pouring poison into everyone's water including the water that i'm going to drink to kill you yeah you know wouldn't make any sense the only time this this fear that i so i have no worries about this with russia or other countries the only time i have i worry about something like that is if uh religious fanaticism oh my God. gets their hold on nukes yeah because they believe so much in their like they're willing to kill themselves anyway Mm, so yeah. that would be a way, like you know what I mean. So if a suicide bomber mentality yeah. got their hands on a nuke, then they—that's what they want. They want mutual destruction. Right. They, they're going to launch a nuke just so that they know everybody else is going to nuke yeah. each other. So what was uh, I, uh, what was that quote? I don't think I've said it on the show yet. What was it? Uh, Einstein? I think he said it. He says, "I don't know what World War Three will be fought with, but I know that World War Four will be fought with sticks, sticks and stones." And stone, yeah. It's a fucked up. Yeah, that's a fucked that's up scary. quote, man. Yeah, fucked scary. up quote. But yeah, so it's funny how Russia is still trying to stay relevant. Yeah, you know. With yeah, their- you're right. And I think it really is. It's just like it's just peacocking, you know. And it, but but yeah, the extremists, the people that like have no disregard, uh, you know, for being rational and 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 logical and. Um, you know, the, they think like it's this higher purpose to do something and it's like this higher call and it's this belief system mm-hmm. that, that supersedes like, you know, all the rest of humanity. That's some scary shit. Dude, you know what it highlights to me is that it shows that humans are, we are, um, we are driven by a, a basic operating system and that operates operating system is not. Necess- it's not your instincts. It's not something you're born with. It's it's an operating system that you plug in, and it's your belief system. Mm. So when people look at people like that who are willing to kill themselves or who do crazy shit or cannibalism, which exists still in parts of the world, or just insane That's stuff, crazy. you think to yourself, like, how could people even think that way? And Well, it's because it's their belief system. Uh-huh. So, so that's why it's so important to push for ideals that's why there's a, a you know being in- inclusive and letting everybody speak their mind is important but it's it's super important to that you also speak your mind and, and and there's a battle of ideas going on because if someone sells their their idea their bad idea better people start using that operating system people start doing some crazy shit right. you know right. what i mean right. so that's why i'm always like Ugh. Yeah, you gotta kind of look Speaking out for that of crazy shit. Yeah, looking right? out for that. Kind of Speaking shit. of crazy shit, yeah, see, like that. That's a good transition. Dude. It's a better transition right there. Yeah. People, you know what the latest trend is. So, this was interesting. Um, I know some people that have actually tattooed uh, their finger uh, to, you know, for if they're getting married and they want to. Katrina have wants to rings. Do that. Yeah, so tattoo well, a ring on your finger. Not the actual ring. She just wants it. Married, something, yeah, something that represents it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> married. on your head. That says married. <laughs> that's hilarious. Unavailable. Yeah, yeah. 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 repellent. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah, yeah, No, so I guess the new trend. I I had no idea this even existed, but the new trend is to pierce your finger. With, mm. Yeah. What so the fuck? I, I should show you guys. I wish we had in the studio, we'd have the TV and Doug could kind of pull it up for you guys. But like, like they literally pierce through flesh, like through the meat of your finger. And then th- it interweaves in through like the top part. And you, some people put a stone right here and it like, yeah, it's like all in. And, and think about that getting inf- infected. You uh, like going to work. Like you obviously don't do a lot of shit with your hands. Right. Well, I think. Oh, oh, it's, oh, it's just like those studs. Look. Oh, look at this. Okay, I get it. Yeah. Oh, gross. You know it's what, really, dude? Yeah, it's just fucking weird. You know, you know what's gonna happen? There's gonna be at some point the cool thing is gonna be have no piercings, no tattoos. Oh, I think so too. Yeah. 
I think I, I wonder think, if I our know, ki- it's already moving. In I wonder direction. if like when we get old, <laughs> our gonna, kids, our you're kids so are like, lame, dad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got a fucking tattoo. Yeah. You're a dork. Yeah. Right. You know, people. Oh man. Yeah. Cool sucks. tattoo dad. Yeah. 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 The yeah. only reason why it, I'm into clean. The only reason why <laughs> it may have, it may hang around there is for the, the, especially if you have art that means something to you that. Mean, it's just like the fashion thing, right? It's mm. a way to, it's another way to express yourself. So I think it. Well, the trendy. I, the, I definitely think the piercing and just putting holes in your body all over the place. So I don't think tattoo. Well, maybe here's what I. So here's what I'm observing. Maybe you guys uh, disagree with me because I'm I'm speculating here. But what it looks to be, what it seems like with the trends of. We'll talk about tattoos for a second. The trends of tattoos so far seem to be where you put the tattoo, uh-huh. and there's been a few trends of types of tattoos. Like there was the Chinese writing for a while. There was the barbed wire for a while. There was. You know, the wings on the back or the garter board belt thing around the leg. Like, I can name a bunch of them that. The tribal, you know, design. But I'm just going to graze right over your dolphin tattoo. Huh? Yeah, yeah. My, yeah. No, that's not a style. Not for men, at least. I'm <laughs> the, the only rainbow. guy that has a dolphin <laughs> tattoo on it. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, so, but mainly what I see with the trending with tattoos is places on the body. So, like, at first it's cool to put it on your ankle, low back, you know, stomach, neck, you know, wherever. So, we're just picking different areas. I, the, the next place is probably the... Not the mid back, lower back or upper back. I'm starting to see mid back. Ribs are starting Dude, to come, neck, coming out of style now. I'll neck tell and you face where. tattoos. Yeah, are neck's perfect. been it, real popular and for some reason. I think it's because like the the more extreme, right? Yeah. And so you go from the neck on the side, but now it's it's throat. So yeah. a lot of people are getting it on the throat, like right underneath throat, the chin, face, head, which I'm skull. Like, wow, yep, that's gnarly. That. Yep. Yeah. So I feel like that eyes. So I feel like people tattoo their yeah. their, their yeah. retina. Yeah, so like, so if, what in the fuck? It feels to me like tattoos won't go out of style until uh, all the spots are have been gone out of style. Like yeah. until everything's gone out, then you're gonna see people be like, "Oh, I don't have any." And by that time, I think we'll be able to do this thing where we'll be able to, you know, I'll be able to hit a button or hit software that goes. <laughs> I get like a cool, uh, I get yeah. like a tribal uh, sleeve. Today. It's almost like on Wally, Tomorrow, it's, you know, where they change it, the color of their suit, but you yeah. just change like your oh, dragon shit. tattoo into right? a, that would be sick, right? <laughs> So you're inked up one day, and the next uh, day you're totally not. Yeah. Right. Oh my god, that would be crazy. Yeah. Come on, that'd Come be on. pretty cool if they could. It's like Second Life or whatever that game is. You yeah. Know, where you just like have your own avatar and you just change Why, yourself all the time. Change your skin well, color. Well, you've already. Yeah. You're like, already oh shit, I need to take. Yeah. You already see those ones that people they do people do all the time now that la- like Hannah tattoos or whatever yeah, yeah, like that yeah. that lasts like a couple weeks yeah, on them. Yeah. I mean, just think of that that process sped up, you know, and and, and mm. better technology where maybe I can just put my arm in a arm or whatever place you want tattooed. Dude, that's a weird idea. <sighs> yeah. Right? Dude, uh, so a trend I want another trend I want to uh, go over, which is in our space of fitness. There seems to be now because more and more studies are supporting what we've been saying for a while now, since day one, that frequency is a major contributor to muscle growth and adaptation. So another study came out where they compared two groups of people: one group training a body part once a week, the other group training a body part six days a week. The six day a week group experienced. Same results or better, so it was actually slightly better. And and now I think, of course, you can go overboard with too much intensity with frequency, right? Because I looked at the study, and yeah. I think they were going to failure every day, which is like, oh, that's crazy. Well. But they still got great results. Here was Here's what a lot of these frequency studies are showing, which, well, you guys know which option. People might not realize this, but more frequency of training results in less muscle soreness. 100%. Right. Of course. Yeah. 100%. Which may be why the a lot of people... St- st- Still feel like bro splits or the super you know once a week high volume oh, workouts I see what you're saying. Yeah. because they get sore because that, that's their indication of, of that's good right. yeah workout that's and then right. that means I'm building that's right no muscle oh, damage I 100 percent think that that's yeah because I, I know guys that would meet that met me that would that saw that I was training like uh like our maps like when we were competing and they would try and do it and they would only stick to it for a couple of weeks and they were like they would freak out because they're they, not sore they're not getting as sore as they were getting before they were hammering everything for one day and I was just like no dude that's just once. it's better. Yeah. The, let me explain something to you. The less soreness you get, it, like you want to manage that. Too much soreness is terrible. Yeah. I remember the first, like, it was one of my. Was like, that a mind blowing thing to it remember? Was, yeah. I, it, I was. It was a certification I was going through. I wish I remember which one it was, it was. But I was talking to the the guy who was teaching the the course afterwards, and we we're talking about that. And he said that to me, and it just was like, yeah. I, said, I, I did doubt my whole my whole career. I thought. Oh, the if I train if I train a body part once a week, I'm going to get sore every time. If I train a body part three or four days a week. 
I'll almost never get sore. Yeah. yeah. Never. And yeah. I can really start to I mean there's a point where I even start to push intensity and I just don't I just don't get sore. Yeah. God, I you still know? hear that like, oh my god, I got so sore, but in a good way. Yeah. 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 Like people always like <laughs> throw that one in like right after it. You're yeah. like, oh yeah, yeah. Especially if they know mind pump because they know we talk but about in it. In a so good like, way. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good <laughs> sore. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. gotcha. No, man, frequency is super important. And this is why, like, so people who follow, like, for example, maps. Uh, anabolic with the trigger sessions and you know we have the three foundational workouts and then the other trigger session days right people who follow it to a t are always blown the fuck away and it's it's basically because you, you are literally maintaining a muscle an adaptation signal every single day the biggest the biggest one of the biggest reasons why you're not building muscle like you want to is because you are simply not having an adaptation signal that's active or high all the time. In fact, you're you're if you're not building anything and you're maintaining or whatever, it means you're building and losing at the same speed. So, because remember, muscles don't really maintain; they either build or they lose or, or they shrink, right? So, gain or, or 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 lose. So, what that literally means is you are gaining and losing equal parts throughout the entire week. So, you have as many days that are anabol as an, you know that are adaptation uh, in the positive as days that are adaptation in the negative because they're both adaptation, right? Losing and gaining muscle. So all you have to do is move it in the favor of more often adaptation in the positive. That's all you're trying to do with your resistance training. And frequency is a very easy way to do that. And so when you throw in that free, so even if you do a body part split, because you can still do a split and just organize it right, you just bump up the frequency, train your body parts more frequently. It makes a huge, and more and more studies keep coming out. And I'm seeing all these, you know, bodybuilding publications I, here's the thing. How long do you think it'll take before pro bodybuilders start doing this? I think uh, some. Of, I think some do. Yeah. I just don't they're think starting to already mess with well, them. It'll right? become yeah. a little more popular, I'm sure. Well, and here's the thing, though. And so, and I remember when I got, uh, and this is you know what we have coming down the road is more reflective, I think, of what I was at at the peak of my competing, where it's a split, but it doesn't look like a split. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's not really a, it's, you're still hitting three muscle groups, you know, a lot of times in a day, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, it, and so you're able to, you know, and you're still hitting frequent, frequent, yeah. you know, times a week. Yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of, I think a lot of guys at, built off of a split. And when, so I think if they realized that if they were to just go to a full body for a little while, they'd benefit from it. But I even think that some of these, most of the guys that are at the pro level, their split doesn't look like the average gym goer that's trying to make a split work either. Not to mention all the other things that come into the yeah. factor too. I so. honestly think a big, just a huge part of it is that adaptation signal that you get from resistance training in some people and a very small percentage of people and pro bodybuilders definitely make up a tiny, tiny fraction of the normal population in terms of this is that they just have an adaptation signal that just fucking stays on. You know, or if I go lift weights and I do a really good job, maybe that adaptation, and I'm experienced, right? So the more experienced you are, the the, the shorter that adaptation st signal stays on, by the way. So if you're a beginner and you lift weights, your body's going to adapt in the positive probably over a 48 to 72 hour period. Some studies show that if you're super experienced, that period is like 16 to 24 hours. Like you're not hitting it some way, maybe at a much lower intensity. Like I, I, read a, I read a study one time that said that uh, after recovery from a muscle, so if you hit it and it gets sore, and, and once it recovers, within within 72 hours, atrophy begins. Yeah, could. But see, here's so, the thing. Now, like, obviously, there, I know that there's tons of variables that go into mm -hmm. that, but I remember reading that study. That, that was the first time that kind of switch for frequency went mm -hmm. off for me. It was like, Well, here, okay, look, at, that, look at it this way. Like When you train less frequently, you're, you're causing more muscle damage, as evidenced by the soreness that you get, right? That means that you're recovering more and ad adapting less. If you can figure out a way to reduce the damage but still send – a muscle building signal and send it more frequently. Now you're adapting more than you're recovering, which is why frequency is so is so such a powerful force. And the more experienced you are, the more frequent you need because that adaptation signal doesn't stay on very long. But I suspect when you have somebody who's just a fucking genetic freak when it comes to this, that they'll lift weights and that shit just stays on yeah. like three, four times longer than the average person. That's what I think that's happening. That oh, they no. just they just they don't have to do nearly as frequent. That and they assimilate food better. I mean, I think there's And I think of course they're, they're on anabolics. Right. Yeah, you, yeah. I definitely think there's exceptions to that rule. That there's a lot of that where you see guys that have begin, be, been very successful with building their physique because it's what works really well from I mean, it was the number one thing that I I thought was the biggest problem was 
I'm not. I can't. It's hard to knock a guy who's a pro who's done mm-hmm. done this to his physique and over and over and over. So and sure, you know, in people's minds, they're watching that. It's like, oh, this trainer's smart, but this guy's done it. I've yeah, seen right. him do sure, it sure, time sure. over time again. But what they don't realize is that he's he's mastered yeah. his own body. It doesn't mean he really understands. And his body's so far away from yours because right. because, because of those genes correlate to you because of those genetics. You know, so it's just a, it's just one of those. It's just cool to see. Because I remember talking about this three years ago on Mind Pump, and people were blown away by what we were saying. And actually, a lot of people were arguing and debating it and saying it's wrong. And it's really cool now to see that it is becoming – it's not the message yet, but it's becoming like part of the discussion. It's, it's, you know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, when we first started talking about small meals. And now it's pretty well established. Now, if you talk to a relatively informed fitness enthusiast – they will they'll know that the small meals things is a myth. Whereas three years ago they didn't. Today, when you talk about training more frequently, it's starting to get to that point where people are like, oh yeah, if you hit the body parts more frequently, you know, and don't go to failure, you know, as often, it's probably, you know, it's probably better for you. Yep. So it's really cool to see that it's uh, you know, that's that's moving in that direction. I I mean the the first times I was clued into that were did you guys ever experience something when you were a kid where you did something well, see, maybe not, because you guys didn't, you guys weren't lifting weights until much later. I was starting to, so I was lifting weights at fourteen, trying to build muscle, and I remember when I was fourteen, trying to build, and I was trying to get bigger arms, trying to get bigger arms, and it was really slow and took a long time. And then there was a period of time where I was like, I had a BMX bike and I was practicing bunny hopping, which requires you to pull up on the handlebars, and especially if you're not proficient at it, you pull really fucking hard because that's what you think does the bunny hop, right? So you just rip it. And I remember for like a week. I would go outside and practice for hours bunny hopping because that's what you do when you try to learn. You just practice over and over. And I, and I used to measure my arms every week. And it was like I gained a half an inch on my arms that week. And I remember thinking to myself like, was it the bunny hopping that made my arms? It sure fucking was. <laughs> then there was when I was 15 and I had to wear a knee brace. So I had to walk with one leg straight all the time, which meant that – so my left leg was straight all the time, but I could still walk. But it required me to push off really hard with my left foot. So I was just walking like that all the time. Now at the time, I was training my calves. Doing my calves weren't growing. And after doing this for a month, my left calf grew a quarter inch, and my right calf didn't. And I was like, was it because I was walking all the time? But I didn't quite put it together that it was that frequency that yeah. was doing it. You know what I mean? But the clues were all there. But I think the reason why it is hard for people is we connect so much to that soreness, like Justin said earlier, and they're they're seeking that. And so when you and then when you real you realize real quick when you switch over from being in this single split to going frequently like three times a week, you can't hammer a muscle like that. You got <laughs> you can't if you hammer like that. It's two days later you're supposed to be back at it, touching yeah, it again. So you're yeah, dreading yeah, coming right. Back to so you got to you have to learn to really scale back if you're going to increase frequency, and that's really tough for someone to do who's trained themselves to to chase the pump, to chase the burn, to chase the soreness. If you're so used to chasing that all the time, trying to make that transition, that's why the the people that I see that that don't like it or fail from it, it's typically that, and it's hard to tell them that. You yeah. know, say so it's like I, they got to figure that out for themselves. You can you can help guide them in that direction, dude. All you got to do is try it for. I mean, if you're really in tune with your body, try it for two weeks. No yeah. joke, two weeks will tell you right away. I, the first time I when I switched, within two weeks I was stronger and I knew, but I, I know my body pretty well. Otherwise, try for 30 days if you're not one of those super in tune people. You have nothing to lose. You really don't. I mean, worst case scenario, it's not as effective if you go back to your old routine. Probably not going to be that way. Right. Try it out. Right. This quaz brought to you by Organify. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organify fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organify totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. All right, our first question is from Eddie the Coach. Sex. Yes. It, oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Sorry. That's, a, <laughs> he got that's it. That's, that's a whole question. Yeah. Wow. No. Is it needed for optimal health or is going without better? Oh, good uh, question. Hey, before you answer that, Adam, <laughs> I don't get Did you pick this one, Adam? <laughs> no, I didn't. I knew Adam was going to jump on it. Wow. I need to ask you a question, though, uh, that I totally forgot. Uh, you you were been having trouble sleeping the past couple nights. 
and I know I made you drink the fucking oh, tea gosh. that you don't oh, like the taste. Yeah. Did, it, uh, did you sleep differently? You know what I think? I think you just like for me to point out all the times that you're right about something on the show. That's of I course. Think. I think any chance you, you can get, put you on the spot, of, dude. Well, I gave him the reishi, the, the four sigmatic, right? Uh-huh. And I did. I put it in the warm. This time I heat. I heated it up because he doesn't like. He's the, being a baby. He doesn't like the taste. Uh-huh. Being a baby. It tastes it. better heated up, right? Yeah. Okay. Did it was, you put a little honey in it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah. it's not it's not awful, you know what I'm saying? It's just I I like tea. And it's just so, not fucking Cytomax or you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it's definitely it's not, not that. purple color. No, yeah, it's yeah, definitely yeah. not or red that. or. But yeah. I did know I it does it does calm me down right before I go to bed, and I like that. So it it did, worked. Yeah, it did. I slept, fucking worked. I slept awesome. really, and we're not at, we're not home, so that's even a, a, a bigger thing for me. Well, too. I know you always have trouble sleeping outside of you know when we travel or whatever, so. Yeah, I that, wanted to make sure I took care of my boy. <laughs> See, Sal the nurturer. I, 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 all day. I appreciate that. Nurturer. You take care of me. Well, Doug's taking care of us tonight, right? Oh, Doug, yeah. I Doug, can't wait for that. Doug's oh, whipping shit. Up, Doug, Doug's whipping up dinner tonight. Doug is an excellent fucking cook. Chef Boy or D. Yes, yeah. indeed. If we ever make a cookbook, it's going to be a lot of your shit. Dude. Well, this this oh, last, sure. the last, was it this? We're throwing right? those Brussels sprout uh, uh, recipe in there. We have to. Oh, well, was sure. it was it this this last Thrive Box or the one before where Doug ordered his stuff? Because this is our first time. I think that- it was about a month ago. I ordered a bunch of stuff with the intention that next time we travel, I'm going to whip up some tasty Thai food. Now, did wow. you get this off of the paleo menu or did you just search Thai? I, ing- I, I just searched the ingredients I needed. So like last night, the intention was to cook a nice Thai dinner with some basil beef and some uh, Penang curry. Mm. Penang but, curry. But, but. I like how that rolls off your tongue. Hamburgers trumped <laughs> my dinner. So, <laughs> that's because we, we got Robert over. Uh, yeah, 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 dude, yeah. We got Robert with us. He's he like, was hungry, yeah. so he didn't have yeah. time to wait for It me. was more of a timing thing. Yeah. It was, yeah. truly. So tonight, my intention is to make a Thai Penang curry with beef, and that includes coconut milk that I got from Thrive Market, some fish sauce I got from Thrive oh, wow. Market. Nice. Um, got some nice spices you can throw in there. Yeah, absolutely. And then right. some basil beef, which is one of my favorites. In fact, I made it for you Back when we created Maps Black, over at the- oh yeah, oh, it was a little yeah. throwback. Uh, yeah, that, that was throwback. good. Yeah, so Thanks, a lot Doug. of these Thai ingredients you can get right over at Thrive Market. Did you buy enough meat? Because we have the giant with us. <laughs> this now. This is a valid. I don't point. know. Do you think fifteen pounds will do it? Uh, well, it leaves about two for us, yeah, so we'll split two pounds. <laughs> yeah. We're good. Yeah. We could all, yeah. you know, fight for that. Which, by the way, uh, uh, living in a house with an actual giant is very interesting. Oh yeah, yeah, it's very totally distorts my perception of how big I, I am. Yeah. I've never felt this small. Entire <laughs> Imagine life. how I feel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I posted a picture of Doug and him next to each other. It's so great. It looks, it looks like Doug's child. The last time I felt this small was when I was in Japan and I sat next to Kanishki, which he was like five hundred and some pounds, a sumo wrestler. Oh, oh shit! Wow. I have a picture. I have to dig it up someplace. Oh, you should have a oh, picture. That I do. You need to find. I have that. these big spectacles on too. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you, have con- like, you have contacts. Uh, I wear contacts at night. I didn't know that. Yeah, I use this thing called orthokeratology. So are those not your beautiful eyes? Well, these are my be- beautiful eyes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, gorgeous good. eyes. Yeah, dude, right. This guy's yeah. got, well, thank you, Adam. He's, got, got, me color, worried. he's yeah. got colored contacts. In. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I actually wear contacts Faking at night, out. and then they ch- change the shape of my eyes. And in the morning, I take my contacts out, and then I can see just fine during yeah. the day. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Really Did cool, you read right? the study on that connection to eye cancer? Uh, no, yeah, I did. I said, hey, forget it. You know. I'm just kidding. Sal's go to. Such a big. All right. Well, well, let's let's get back to sex. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, yeah. I re- like it. So is it important let's for health? Is sex important for health? It's it's a it's it's in us primal, man. We're supposed to reproduce. So Dude, it for- is part of the relationship. You know, this is something that it, it is important. You know, it, like being fit. Like that's how like a lot of times like you can express love between, you know, your partner. But it's like. You know, obviously, it's it's something that gets kind of distorted because it's you know, as men, we 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 have this like novelty thing that we yeah. keep thinking about. But yeah, it's definitely something that, um, you know, is constantly bringing me close to my partner. You know, at the same time, communicating well, all that stuff, it all plays a factor. So it's mm. definitely a big factor. So it's so it's not as clear. It's first at first take. It's not as clear as like food and water and air and shelter in terms of how important it is to you because. Obviously, without food, water, you know, you would you yourself would die. Without sex, you'd stay alive, but the human species would die. 
Yeah. So, so it is a fundamental thing that we have as humans that's extremely important. Now, it's programmed. Yeah. Like we, we feel that programming to like yeah. that we need to do this. Now, is it important for humans to have sex? Well, it's again, it's hard to separate because being healthy physically, emotionally, mentally usually means you have a healthy libido. Actually, no, it does mean you have a healthy libido because that tends to be a part of it. So, if you have sex issues, is that bad for your health? I think there's definitely a positive feedback loop, but having bad sex or having bad relationship with sex could also be the result of poor physical health, poor emotional health, and poor maybe even spiritual health. Now, that being said, is avoiding sex bad for you? Depends on your belief system and where you're at with it. Right, like, right. It, it, it could be a distraction for you. It could be hmm. uh, something that you're addicted to. I mean, I've I've Definitely have sure. friends that are sex mm-hmm. addicts and yep. they, if anything, uh, fasting from that and actually going without for a while is helping them get better connected with themselves and mm-hmm. re-est- reestablish their own values, right? So I think- You get better dreams. I do think, <laughs> yeah. You learn to love yourself a lot, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, I think it depends. It really, it depends on the person. I think, uh, if, generally speaking, if, you know, you have a normal relationship sex, you have a normal relationship with your partner- um, and you, you don't have some weird views on it. I think that absolutely it's a, it's a healthy thing that you want to have. I mean, I know personally for myself and our, our relationship, it's extremely important. Um, it's, it's definitely, I, I mean, here's some things that are like anecdotally speaking. I mean, I can tell, uh, my attitude and I can tell Katrina's attitude when I don't think ever the next 24 hours of our relationship hasn't been anything but super positivity like right after sex it's oh, it's yeah. it blows my and it's and it's on both sides it's not just her it's mm-hmm. not just me it's like i all of a sudden i'm more willing it's to like do mental clarity it it's is like, wow it's, i can well, think all of, a sudden, all of a sudden you're <laughs> it's like you you share something with your partner that and i don't know if it's this process of you're giving to them on this deeper level because what i notice is um because and i catch myself with my own behaviors but i notice in hers too where, you know, I, I all of a sudden proactively go do the dishes, you know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Help her with something that she didn't even ask help totally. for. Yeah. And that's, you know, a lot of times I can get so focused on myself and what I'm doing and all the work that I have. And she's very self-sufficient, so mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about her. But after we bond and connect like that, I catch myself being more more into that and paying attention to that more. So, I mean, that again, this is just what I've... And I see that from her too. I mean, any time that... We have that connection the next day, the next 24, 48 hours. I feel like mm-hmm. she's very attentive to my needs. You're more so, like in tune, yeah, with your with each, each other. Needs. Right, right. And it's a tough, it's a tough subject to try to quantify when you're talking about like how much sex is healthy, what is healthy sex between two people, because we have general averages, but that doesn't necessarily mean that doesn't mean much for individual couples. It just shows what the average, you know, what average people do. I think the most important thing, if you're talking about sex for a relationship, the most important thing is I think you should both be compatible. And what I mean by that is you could have a very healthy, high sex drive, but that would be terrible if your partner has a very healthy, less, you know, high sex drive, right? Now there's a bit of a, of a discrepancy there. So, and you know, so if you don't have a lot of sex together, but that's how both of you like it and both of you are just wired that way or whatever, and, and that's healthy for you. Then that's great if you guys have tons of sex, but that's a, that you know that could also be dysfunctional. By the way, you know, to, a lot of sex can be a distraction. It could be just based on oh, many a times. Lot of things. Many times is a signal that the relationship is built only on lust. Yeah. You know, oh that, yeah, you could have that's like true. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. absolutely, abso- absolutely, and yeah. and it nor, more often than not, when that's the case, it's it's feeding something else. You know, it's feeding some other insecurity that you that you have that's driven you to be attracted to that type of person and then that's all you see in there yeah. is the lust. But if you're if you're a healthy individual, your sex drive is typically uh healthy in the sense that it's not distracting you. So some people and I think especially men will attribute a super high sex drive with healthy and that's only because we've connected lots of sex and high sex drive with being manly and that's what healthy is and yeah, I like to bang all the time. I got all the, you know boners all day long or whatever and men joke joke that way. So we think I sexual talk that way all so the time. yeah so sometimes co- sexual compulsion can be you know confused for being healthy like no i'm a healthy man like i do you know i have sex all the time and i have all this meaningless sex that's not necessarily healthy either i think a healthy sex drive is probably not distracting like it's not getting in the way of life um, but it's healthy enough to where you feel good about it you feel comfortable with it and you have good relationship with someone else who or other people or whatever plural 
that you have sex with. And that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, a really low sex drive, that can be an indicator of, of poor hormone health for sure. Mm. You see this being displayed. So problems with hormones uh, and, and sex are common. Problems with stress and sex are probably more common. Oh, 100%. And I think sometimes people 100%. confuse that with hormones, uh-huh. right? Well, I mean, I share this all the time on the show that, that that was something that was a major thing that I connected was realizing that I could be on all these uh, anabolics and still not have a sex drive. I mean, Because you're was, stressed out. Yeah, because of work stuff. And, I, and it was so obvious because there would be always something going on, a big decision or we'd take on a new employee and the revenue wasn't quite there. And so it's like, oh God, all of a sudden I feel the weight of the world on me. And then sex drive is just mm-hmm, pff, yeah. completely flat. Mm-hmm. I didn't notice that before my 30s. It wasn't until beyond my 30s that I start to really start to mm-hmm. connect that and go like, fuck, this is important, you know? What's interesting about the the desire to have sex, of course, it's rooted in uh, procreation, but there's a lot more that goes to it. Like uh, for women, sex has been, for, for thousands of years, has been a form of currency. And I don't think that it's not a conscious thing, although in some cases it is a, a conscious thing. But in many ways, it was, you know, look, Female mammals or female human mammals are are one of the only mammals on Earth that have sex when they're not in heat, or at least when they can't get pregnant. Where most mammals, the majority, the vast majority of female mammals have sex only when they can get pregnant. Human females can only get pregnant really in a, in a short period, in a short window during the whole month. The rest of the month, their odds of getting pregnant are incredibly small, and yet human females have sex. Throughout their entire, you know, throughout the entire month, and so you, you, you know, one of the big, big questions is why, and it's because that's probably one way she kept the man around, or at least kept him from, because a man who had children with lots of other women meant his resources were going to get spread to other women, or maybe he'd find one that he preferred over you, which was bad news for you and your child, because that was a major responsibility and potential burden for most of human civilization. So women, that was a very strong currency. And what I mean by that is it is you'll find that uh, sometimes women will get turned on in under certain circumstances, not realizing that's because they're, it's, that's, that's one of the, the driving factors. For example, makeup sex, very, very, tends to be very aggressive, tends to be very passionate, <laughs> and it, it tends to be driven by the female. And it's because, you know, instinctually, probably, she almost lost her mate, but she wants him. She wants to make sure she keeps him and not realizing that now she's very passionate and it might be driven from there. So it's kind of fascinating to see the, the behavior behind sex. I try. I tried to reach out, I think, a month or two ago um, to that sex with Emily girl. I thought she would be oh, a really she'd be- fun – she'd be a fun one to talk to, um, especially since we're, we've got a question like this because I, I love talking to somebody that's all they study is that because it, it's – I think it is uh, – Super fascinating, very interesting. I think there's many variables. I think uh, so many unique. Oh, it's it's one of the reasons why I like I like the behavior of it. It's so fascinating. Like why promiscuity is strongly correlated with like uh, poor relationship with the opposite sex, especially in females. So well, you made a point about how important it is too that that you find someone who you you are on the same level or connect yes. with. I think that's really important because there's a lot that happens to us in our like formative years too that really shapes us in our, our sexual mm-hmm. behaviors, you know, even the way you view your mom, dad. I mean, I don't know how much you subscribe to like a lot of the Freudian theories and stuff like that, but there's, dude, it's for sure. Oh, it's for something sure. that could go all the way back to childhood bro, or someone. You're going to change that person's bro. Just think of taboo. Like, yeah, like imprints. You humans part. find humans find, uh, or derive, uh, excitement, uh, out of taboo and taboo changes. So this is, you guys will love this. I saw an old, uh, someone posted this on up uh, uh, up some Facebook page, but it was a it was a menu from a from a brothel from like 150 years <laughs> ago. Give you like a schnozwamble. That, like like, a, yeah, like like an old like like brothel menu of prices of uh, sexual acts. Like they'd have a menu like, oh, if I want a blowjob, if I want to, you know, if I want to have intercourse. What were the or names for all the different? Uh, I don't remember. Activities. But oh. the most expensive. <laughs> there's, but, <laughs> there's there's those so, activities again. So the let me add. So coming. trip off this, right? Trip yeah. off of this. Today, and and I have no. Obviously, this is this, and this was based off of that article, and I think it's true by the way people make jokes and stuff, right? Today, if you were to hire a prostitute, the 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 probably the one of the least expensive sexual things you could do with her. Besides, like a like you know manual stimulation, which would be like a hand job, would be a blow job. Like a blow job would cost less than 
sex, right? Much right. less typically. And this is this is what I read in the article, like the, the going price for blowjobs and prostitution in legal brothels in in in, in Nevada. So if you go to a legal brothel, blowjob is, cheap, is cheaper than sex. On this old menu from 150 years ago, a blowjob was by far the most expensive thing, because <laughs> blowjobs were way more it. taboo back then, mm. uh. and, and 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 so there, it was more valuable. Men wanted them because it was something that women. Their partners probably didn't do like, oh, my wife doesn't do that. That's only for you know whatever, yeah. right? Very interesting. So taboo is very is very fascinating. So the things that we think are taboo kind of excite us and make us want to do it more, which is why I think it's super important to have a partner where you and your partner are so safe with each other in the sense that you can express your own potential sexual desires that you don't that I think will prevent potential problems. <laughs> or perversions or obsessions later on because if you have a partner who's like, I'm not doing that or you can't even talk about that sexual thing, mm -hmm. forget not doing it because a lot of people are like, ooh, don't even talk to me about that. You may start to obsess about that thing and it becomes a, a taboo and a fetish and it could cause yeah. like sexual issues for you. Right. You know? Kind of interesting, right? No, that's that's really interesting. It reminds me of what uh, Lisa Bilyeu just said when we were, we were just hanging out with her about the uh, – they how her and Tom once a week, but this is more like towards their selfish pleasure – in general speaking, but how important that probably is for a relationship to make sure you express those those selfish desires sexually that you have. If you don't do that and you don't communicate to that partner how long that, that sits sits under there. And I think it makes it bigger. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Right. Have you ever been with a partner where you're like, oh, this is a little, you know, you're in your mind, right? You're like, okay, this is a little, like I'm going to express something. Let's see how they react. Yeah, you then you nervous. say it. Yeah, you, why, don't you, why don't you explain that, bro? Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Come I'm on. Gonna, I'm so you really got to turn your sales hat on, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. He's like, don't worry. It'll be okay. I'm like using instruments. Don't worry. Yeah. We'll, Babe, come, I, yeah, we'll I, come up with a, we'll come yeah. up with a safe word. I know you oh, have a safe okay? word. It's yeah. this size. Yeah. Yeah. Okay I, know, yeah. I know you have a question about all the latex rubber, the mats and the cameras. Before we get into that. Why is there visqueen all over the floors? I'll get to that. But anyway, you could... You have a conversation with this person about it, and they're super open and safe about it, and then you find that that thing is no is not really a big deal because you were able to express it. Versus where you feel like you can't say something, and then it becomes even bigger and bigger in your mind because of that whole taboo factor. Right, whatever, right. Yeah. You know? So anyway, next question, please. I want anal. Next up is David J. Schroer. Where do you guys see the future of personal training? Ooh. The future of personal Ooh. training, way, way more growth in virtual and online personal training. I hope we're a part of that. Than, yeah. uh, than, than the growth in personal training in person. I, I won't be as bold as to say I think the personal training in person market <clears throat> is going to be flat, but I've definitely seen it slow down its growth. It's going when it got when I, it started exploding in the 90s. I think it's going to look a lot more like um and I know Bedros will disagree with us on that. Right, right? Yeah, yeah, but I'll argue this all day. I think it's going to look more like like the way Dr. Brink has started his his clinic. I think trainers will have like the same similar type of a clinic setup, for example, mm -hmm. where I charge you pretty top dollar to come in and get like this full on huge assessment for me to just check every joint in the body, kind of see how you move, go through a full assessment with you and work on your mechanics and then give you all, I mean, then you would lay out a program that's all specific and you'd be able to give detailed videos. Yeah. And, I mean, once you and have- And it's just like little Skype sessions to kind of right. like check up on you and see how everything's yeah. going I mean, progressing. You'll you'll literally have all, You'll I think with this this era we're in now where we, can, we document everything that we're doing, like a business like ours is when you think about it, when we keep 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 uh, adding to these videos, I mean, look, this is only what three years in, mm -hmm. oh. and we've only been doing YouTube. You know what I think? Imagine I when you have a, a a very good detailed answer for every question yeah, that a client yeah. could potentially yeah, want. It, like, it, it sounds a lot like, and you mentioned Doctor Brink's facility too, which I think uh, you know definitely, but also like Doctor Molly Maloof, the way that she. Um, gets all aggregates all this data and then interprets it for her clients like and, and shows okay here's all, all these biomarkers here's what's going on here's what we we maybe can adjust and tweak so you know the the further we get with sensors and the further we get with technology that's relevant uh, if we're able to kind of then incorporate that into the platform and so now the coach can just have like well your macros were here you know your heart rate was you know super elevated you know in this portion and like they see like all this data uh either real time or at least they can kind of 
go back and see like what mm-hmm. was going on with your body throughout the workout process and then how I think we're, we're, I think we're going to crazy see, I think we're going to see less of uh, coaches and personal trainers telling people exactly what to do and more a bit of a growth in coaches and personal trainers who are going to teach people how to read all these new devices and things think in order about to identify you know oh, individualize yeah. their own programming I mean talking about the 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 GSMs the, the glucose uh, uh the glu- the continuous excuse me CGMs yeah, continual CGMs. glucose monitors um i mean talk about being able to read your own individual reaction to what you're eating in real time right that is we're going to be easily able to, the most we're going to be able to deliver every answer you could potentially need to progress your body and find your answers out with instantaneously into your fingers mm-hmm. it, the only, and this is why because that's the beginning. The this, CGMs I, are the I beginning. Watched, I watched my own I evolution as a trainer. It's going to be And huge. it wasn't until just this last couple years that I get to the point where uh, it's crazy. I, my job, I was doing less. I was doing less for my, my people, and I was getting more results. Because what do we all know? We know that the client that you that asks you, Sal, write me down a workout and a diet, and you write it down, and I'm going to follow it. I don't want to learn. I don't yeah, want anything. Yeah. That person never sees long term. Never, 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 ever, ever, ever. 100% of the time, that person, the people that do get to see, that do see it or keep it going are the ones that actually kind of fall in love with the learning process that look like, oh, wow, you you help connect dots for them and then they become passionate about it. So what I'm thinking is that the future is definitely just helping people connect those dots faster and more efficiently like tools of like course. that. Yeah. And you, it's going to be less of yeah, the there's, there's nothing that's not going to require much of your skills. No, there's nothing wrong with having a, a set out plan for you that's designed by a professional, even nutritionally. The problem is when the coaching stops there. Like it, You need to know the whys behind what they are and then start to pay attention and see how you're reacting to because here's what a good trainer can do. A really, really good trainer can take all their knowledge and experience and can give you the best guess as to what's probably going to work best for you. And it is by far the best guess. And, and it's going to be in the general correct direction for the most part. But if the, if the trainer stops there, they've, they've done you know 20% of their job. The other 80% is now how do we take that and start to tailor it and, ident- and identify signals in your body and move in the right direction to where now... You have the routine. Think about it this way. You have a, gl- a continual glucose monitor, right? Imagine if you had a monitor, which I'm sure they can somehow create this because we already know we can measure this. It's just the equipment required isn't something that you can have on and, and you can monitor right away. That technology hasn't been invented. But at some point, what if you can measure measure your adaptation signal? Oh, mo- muscle protein synthesis is going up. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, I peaked. Shit, it's starting to come down. Let me go do this exercise or whatever. Yeah. Now... You're literally training your body based off of objective measurements in real time. Yeah. For sure, the future is going to look a well, lot dude, more I like mean, that. The sensors with shirts, like it seems a little bit silly right now at this point, but like we're talking about the future. Like, so, you know, I mentioned with the, the cardio threshold, you know, how they're measuring that with the chest expansion and stuff like that. It's like this is all happening without you having to. Uh, really do anything other than wear a shirt and then you're getting that data so now somebody can interpret that and be like listen you know at this pace is what you want to keep consistent to Mm -hmm. be able to make this time and it's very accurate that you know it's probably going to play out that way. You know what we're we are five to ten years away from and I think it's closer to five away from a device that's non-invasive that measures your insulin uh, reaction and maybe some other parameters but uh, for now we know insulin you put it on and you eat normally like you normally do. And all it does is aggregate data. All you have to do is enter in what you're eating every time you eat it. So, oh, you know, I'm eating, you know, uh, you know, four ounces of cheese. You know, I'm eating, you know, a handful of peanuts. That's all you have to do. That particular device will measure the metrics with what you've entered. And after wearing it for a period of a week to a month, it will tell you what your macros need to be. It will tell you what foods to avoid which ones that you should eat you think, based off of what it was measuring, based you, off of its own observation. Who do you think it figures it out first? You think Apple? You think Apple does it for us? I think I don't think they create it, there's but I think they would buy there's it. There's obviously going to be steps no, and it's phases I, of it. I don't think they're I don't think they're serious enough about health yet. I mean, I, I'm yet to see it. Like I know they've built 
um, you know, parts like the the health kit and things like that that they can kind of get all of your devices to kind of yeah. But you're also aggregate, gonna, but you're gonna th- there's gonna be one side that creates the chip and stuff like that that has the ability to read all the stuff. The next, the other part is gonna be the platform that up re- uploads uh, and reads well, it. You know, that's I, where I think Apple. Okay, is. no, I take it back because you know why? Gar- guaranteed. Between their Apple Watch, like that'll be the first introduction, and they're gonna put the, uh, um, you know, continual glucose monitor in the watch. In the watch, because right. it just makes sense. Right. That would right? be that would be money. So you know, the data that they're gonna get from that's gonna be so but bro, powerful. Just imagine, like you wake up in the morning and you know you look at your app or whatever or, or because of this monitor that's on you, and it says to you like, well, based off of the parameters, or whatever today. This is you should eat a high fat breakfast. You shouldn't yeah. have too many carbohydrates and avoid these kinds of foods. Bro. And oh my god, like that's it, your diet every day. You just look at it and it tells you what to do, mm-hmm. and you follow. And because it's measuring your individual body, like you're going to learn a lot. You're going to start connecting dots. In fact, I think it it, it probably will do you know that what, for you. Know you know what our trainer job may end up being more like? It may end up evolving to like teaching people how to become intuitive with all these tools, knowing that, yeah, that's with, it. knowing when to not be dependent on all these. Well, tools. that's it, right? Because we're it's yes. gonna, it's gonna it's gonna revolutionize how we can all help ourselves yes. get healthy and in shape with all these markers and feedback. But, but then they mean neurotic about it, right? Well, then it's just like us with uh, directions, right? Mm-hmm. I rely on. Google MapQuest. I would be fucked if my if my phone went down and yeah. I had to get to this house where we're at right now, yeah. right? Right. I wouldn't. I would have to go find a map. You know how hard it would be for me to go go yeah. to a gas station, find a map, and then try and figure yeah. out where the, uh, without yeah. the use of my phone. Oh, if I didn't have my calculator right. to, to do like solve right. math equations, I'd be fucked. That's yep. and yep. that and I think because we're talking about ourselves that we're so disconnected from because we're going to be plugged into this. So that we, part of our job, I think, will be. Teaching people how to distill that information. God, like, okay. just imagine if they had that for exercise, though. You know what I mean? Like, oh, dude. Totally. Like, oh, well, based off of these measurements, squats at the eight rep range are benefiting you the most right now, or some dude, shit like gyms that. Gyms are are just going to be completely littered with sensors everywhere. Mm. Like, there's just going to be sensors on everything because whatever you pick up, you're gonna it's going to know how many how much weight it is, how many reps you're doing, like all that shit. It's all going to be. Awesome. And we're gonna have old timers like us who are like, give yeah. me the fucking iron and the chalk. <laughs> yeah. I don't but want no those, electronics. In it. Yeah, but those will have electronics in it anyway. Yeah. It'll I be it, it. it'll be interesting to what it, how how much easier it makes it for people to get in shape. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you just because you have that feedback, like how did I? I mean, a lot of people are just unaware and yeah. they and they have no desire to become aware. But if you had something that was buzzing on you that just said, that said like you said, Sal, like well, you should eat something with this between these calories right now yeah you know? it's only going to be useful with a coach that interprets all that for you you know like i th- feel like it'll get lost with a, with like your everyday person it can they be know how to use it they're just gonna be like it can ah. be so, the, the, the tra- so the future of trainers is being aware of this and then knowing how you fit into that yeah right because as these things come out there's gonna you're, there's gonna be somebody like you said who's gonna need to be able to explain this to them and teach them how to be practical I mean, yep. so I, I think the sooner you re- if you're a personal trainer the definitely. sooner you realize that your job is to change how your clients think, uh, change how they process nutrition, how they think about food, how they think about exercise. And the sooner you realize that, you know, teaching them how to listen to their body is the most important thing, the more uh, money you'll be able to make and the more value you're going to provide to your clients. If you believe that you are the person that just tells them what to do and I got to motivate them by getting them excited and hyped, you, you stay on that train, you're going to be, you're going to have a tough time making a living. Oh, dude, I, that's, yeah. I think that's when we're finally going to see all that bullshit die, dude. It's coming to an end real quick. Here I think with, so. With the, 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 all the hype and motivation. I think so. Because it's I not think, getting anybody results. Yeah. It's all short-term yeah. results. And, and, and the, the quality it's of trainers, the quality of trainers has slowly gotten better as the market's gotten more competitive. I do believe that. Um, and I think they're going to keep having to get better as with all this technology and stuff that's coming out. Because a lot of the stuff's going to be able to do what the average trainer did 10 years ago. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, well, I don't need to, I don't need you to do me to do that for me. I can get all this online. Like I don't need any of that stuff. Yeah. Well, you know? look how cool it is even being for us for even consuming knowledge and information. I mean, just 15 years ago when I was trying to learn, I was picking up certifications and reading textbooks where, I mean, you fast forward to now, it's so easy to, there's a lot of really good dudes on YouTube. There's a lot of really good dudes. Bro, I read, I read a study the day after yeah. it's released now. Right. And, like, I, and I read it myself. Right. Whereas before it's it would crazy. be an article about it that come out, you know, months later. Either way for a magazine subscription. Yeah. that and, and only if it fed into their narrative would they even publish it. Right. right. I mean, the, the ability to, to get information now is. Yeah. is so I think that's going to that's, be vastly, di- it'll be very different. 
in that sense. But trainers are still going to be yeah. – you still got to be an, a very good People coach. need filters. I think so. something that Drama said on our podcast is such an important thing, and I wish I remembered exactly what he re- he gave as an analogy for each one, but is just like the way the future is going where – you know, business cards are dead, and now that's like your your Instagram is now your business card, and yeah. your email is your ability to uh, advertise to your all these all these pieces that are now same stuff that was a hundred years ago. Yeah. It's just a different means of getting that information. Well, and, for sure, know. now to uh, a successful trainer, for sure needs to have a okay, a, you know, decent understanding of social media. Yeah. That was that's very different from when I was training people even. Five years ago, six years ago, it wasn't that big of a deal. But today, yeah. you, you you know, it'd be like it'd be like a trainer ten, fifteen years ago who didn't have a, a business card. Yeah, you're like, what are you doing without a business lost card? In the dust. Well, yeah. where, where I think it's tough is if you're a trainer that's working inside of a facility and maybe you think that you're going to stay. That's what. That's how, the thing. Yeah, yeah, you, you're in your little bubble and you think you don't need to. Yeah. No, man, start setting it up now because you're going to need it. Right, yeah. I agree. And maybe they'll come up with hologram trainers. Hmm. Did you guys see? Was you who put the car that has the hologram in it already? Did you see that? Uh. Uh-uh. You didn't see that? No. So you know how like where um, you know Tesla has the, the computer screen or anything yeah, that? Yeah. It's all, all hologram and you can like literally – it's like all the icons are floating and you can just tape your finger like this and yeah. it's – Oh, it looks dope. That's, that's, that's a, yeah, cool. That's totally a thing that a guy would want his car to show, <laughs> off, to, to, show off to a chick. It's like, hello. Hey, oh, yeah. What kind of car do you drive? Eh, uh, it's not that big of a deal. <laughs> 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 oh, no big deal. Go ahead. Stick your hand in it. Yeah. It dances sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Next question is from – Claire DeLune, 555. What are your thoughts on necessary nutrition for children and the best way to teach them about health, eating healthy, especially when eating away from home? Growing up, my mom rarely bought junk food and I would stuff myself with potato chips at friends' houses. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So um, there's a couple things you have to consider when you're when you're dealing with your kids. First and foremost, Consider the, the, the context uh, that they exist within currently and, and what it's gonna what it's probably gonna continue to look like as they get older. And that context is modern Western society. Now, if we look at modern Western society, currently our best guess of what is probably gonna be the thing that uh, that they have to overcome or the thing that they're gonna have challenges with has to do with their health. Um, and it has to do with chronic illness and it has to do with uh, nutrition. So this is the biggest – so if we went back a 1,000 years, the context was I better teach my kid how to hunt and get food because otherwise they're not going to know the skill and they're going to starve. Today, it's I better teach my kid good food relationships. How to navigate. How to navigate food and how to not over overconsume and how to not eat these particular types of foods because otherwise they're, they're going to run a very high risk of – Getting diabetes, Alzheimer's, obesity, like all these different problems. So that so, and I'm saying that because I want parents to understand that teaching your kids how to navigate nutrition is one of the most important things you could do as a parent. Yeah. And and I'm not saying that because I think that's the most important thing, period. <laughs> Just because in the lifestyle that we live today, that is becoming one of the most important things. Just, it is well, important. just don't tell them because I told you so, or this is going to make you fat. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Right. It's like there has to be a lot of education uh, with that. So it's not just like you're demonizing certain foods, and it's it's you like super restrictive. You know, like we're just eating clean, and in this house we only eat this and that. Because no. then, you know, that inevitably will happen. They'll go to their friend's house, and they'll see cake, and they'll see. But- you know, I, I nothing think, potato I chips think, and they'll go what, crazy. I think why this is really challenging is because some people, you know, I, they, I, ju- they don't think it's important. Well, not so much that. I think well, that I'll what, argue it. If you're, I'll, if, I'll you're if you're listening, if you're listening to our show, I, I think you're the type of person who understands the importance. That's why you asked this question. You you understand the importance of it. You respect the information that you hear from the, these three knuckleheads, but then you can't maybe distill it as well to your child. That's tough to do. You know, it's already tough to regurgitate the information that you're learning, right? That you don't, you didn't know that much about until you heard it, right. and now you got to turn around and teach it to a child. Mm. That's tough to well, do. So, what I would, I, what I would argue is, a lot of times, some parents, and not, not, don't get me wrong, back up, and I think a lot of parents be fucking it up. But I think there's a lot of parents that are under, are starting to understand, like a lot of these foods are not good. I probably shouldn't be letting my kid stuff his face with it. But they don't know the, the the process to to get it. So here are my thought process. So first, the first thing is, and I'm, I bet money you guys will agree with me on this. The most effective way to teach your child anything is to be it by example. By far, nothing is more effective than example at all. Say whatever the fuck you want to your kid. If you do the opposite, which one are they going to listen to? Yeah. They're going to listen to what you do, yeah. not what you say. So that's number one. Number two. 
when people truly understand and comprehend the importance of something on, the, on a real level, their behavior fundamentally changes, period. So if I, if I firmly believe, if I'm somebody that truly believes in conserving energy and in keeping the earth clean, if I'm someone who honestly believes it, I don't just pay lip service like, yeah, I believe in conservation. I believe If I really believe it, you'll know when you go to my house. You'll know by how I operate my life, how I drive or how I take public transportation or what I do with waste or, you know, the way I live will reflect that and show what I actually truly value, not what I pretend to value, you know, to everybody else. All right. So when it comes to nutrition, a lot of parents pretend to value nutrition. They pretend like, oh yeah, no, my kids, yeah, I'm very serious about their health and nutrition. I'm very serious about how they eat. This is very important. But then you go to their house and you see how the parents feed themselves. And that tells you that they're full of shit. The truth is, if you truly understand the importance of it, you yourself will live it for yourself. And that by far, right. nothing else is a better teacher for your child. Now, as far as your kids going to other houses, here's what I've experienced. What I've experienced with kids who live in a house that just understands and, and values and prioritizes health on a real level, not you know because of aesthetics or not because you know, don't get fat. And I'm not talking about the negative. I'm talking about true like health and wellness and they understand it. What happens to these kids when they go to other kids' houses is they either A, learn their lesson because they seek sweets, they overconsume and they get sick. Yeah. And then they're like, this doesn't feel good. Uh-huh. Or B, here's what my kids do. When we go to a party and my kids are like, you know, it's a birthday party and they, they look at me like, can I have a soda? And I'll be like, yeah, you can have a soda. I don't fucking restrict, by the way. I'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah you can have a soda. They'll drink a quarter of the soda and they'll put it down. They don't want anymore. This happened. And this is very common with kids who live this way. Uh-huh. They have these like natural limiters and governors in their body because they normally don't eat that way. And as an adult, uh, you know, who, who's tr- practiced fasting in the past and done other things, I've experienced that too. If I eat really, 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 you know, good and I feed my body properly or whatever, it's that's over- so I, don't, I, I don't over, I don't consume or over consume as much yeah, as that's I would. Yeah, that's so tough though. Those, I mean, fucking Lay's chips were designed so you can't just eat one. For sure. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But you'd like, be able so- to eat more of them if you ate them every day, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah, as part of your life. I agree. It's just that you're, you've trained yourself to already crave them and want them and then you do them. But I think even, even without that, even the first time you bit into a Lay's chip, who didn't like that? Yep. Who didn't like that? There's the I challenge that. Yeah, yeah, of course. You know what I'm saying? Of course. Like, I mean, you could be a kid that was doing all good, and then all of a sudden you get your hands on of that course. shit. Someone else. Just does. so here's a couple things. That I, I think what where the, where the real thing is is the conversation. And this is just again mm-hmm. how how on to, how on top of your game are you as your parent? You have this awareness now because you you did that as a child. So now you're thinking as a kid, this could be happening to my kid. Pay attention. They might get a stomach ache the next day. They might have. They might be grumpy the next day. Connect it for them. Yes, yeah. help them connect that to how they feel. Right. And because more than likely, the the body will show, especially that small of a person, that young of an age, and introducing that fucking garbage that early, their body will tell you something. They won't just run through it. They'll dude. act. You see, you told you guys bring this up all the time about sugar. Oh, I don't dude. even have kids. Oh, dude. And I've seen it before. Let me you tell know, you, the behavior completely the, changes. The, the sugar crash in a child is, it's actually. If you really look at so what happens what's what's the stereotype of a sugar cr- crash in a kid right what do you see Justin they get cranky, cranky yeah they get they want to cry yeah, yeah. Like, it, all over the place yeah man. irritable like scatterbrained right now think of the state of mind because you're when little kids are great in the sense that they just act out what they feel they don't they don't they're not as aware as adults are right socially they're, so they're if, just developing that they're just yeah so so as an adult if I feel cranky and I'm around <laughs> a bunch of people. I might just be quiet because I'm like, I, I, I'm feeling kind of cranky. A little kid's just going to cry and scream or whatever, yeah, right? He's become irrational all Bro, of a sudden. Bro, think of the state of emotional being and mind that your kid is in when they feel that way. You're fucking doing that to your kid yeah. when you feed them shitty and they get all cranky. Like, you're giving these like temporary periods of anxiety and depression, essentially, is what's happening. Right. Yeah. Like, that's kind of fucked up, right? If you no. think about it. No, it's crazy. You know? So, so you know, here's a couple things that I that, that I do. First off, I'm I'm very obviously... It's pretty easy to communicate that you don't tell your kid don't eat this cuz you'll get fat or eat this otherwise you're going to be yeah. you know skinny or That's whatever. That's just stupid. That's just stupid. Here's the one most <laughs> but people People do that by the they way. Do. Yeah. They do do Terrible. I have been around and seen that Terrible. multiple times. You want to have a kid develop a uh, uh, eating disorder. That's, That's one of the hardest ones for me to not like jump in and say something real oh, quick. Yeah. That's yeah. how I That's and how, I don't even have kids. I'd imagine you guys have kids you probably get even more defensive. That's how you, you get it. That's how they develop eating disorders. It, the but here's the less obvious one that is actually almost as uh, uh, as important. It's how you talk about yourself. 
So if you're a mom right. and you have a daughter and you're very aware of like you want to make sure your daughter doesn't develop body image issues, you want to make sure she doesn't have eating disorders, but you constantly say, you know, you look in the mirror and be like, oh my God, I look fat today. Or, oh my God, I gained weight. Or I feel bloated. Or I don't look pretty today. You keep talking about yourself that way. Yeah. Your child. They're going to mirror that. They mirror that and they learn it quite a bit. Yeah. So, and they learn, they learn it because they see what you value and your kids just want to be what you value. So, mm-hmm. if you communicate to your kid inadvertently that you value skinny and pretty and, you know, that kind of stuff, then they're going to want to be that to try to, because they think now that you value that and that can create problems. So, talk about yourself in a way that you would talk to your own kid. So don't say shit, negative shit, shit about yourself in, in that kind of a way. You can be objective and be like, wow, I, I made a bad decision yesterday or I don't feel good or you know what, that was, th- I should have done this, this would have been smarter. That's okay, but don't say things like, oh, I'm fat or I don't, you know, because uh-huh. they'll, they'll internalize. That's a big one. The other one too is, you know, when I say like, it's just the way it is, like here's an example. At, at my house, this is something we implemented months ago and it's been one of the best things we ever did and this is kudos to my girlfriend this was actually her her idea and I, it was actually quite brilliant when we serve dinner at the dinner table it comes in courses and it starts with vegetables and so it goes vegetables first then it goes proteins and fats and then if they're going to have starches that night which they do I'd say 80% of the time I'll provide them with a starch 20% of the time it'll be maybe some fruit then the starch follows. They don't move to the next level until they eat at least some of the first level. And I'm realistic. So I know, okay, my daughter's probably not going to like this vegetable dish. Okay. So I'm going to put a little bit on her plate and she'll be like, oh, can I have the meat? I'll be like, as soon as you finish that, then I'll give you the meat. And it was like one or two days of like a little bit of battling. And now it's just, this is how we eat. They know they're going to eat this first and move on to the next thing. And it's no longer this discussion. It's just how we eat. And what's also starting to happen now is they're starting to crave vegetables. And they know, is dinner ready? And we'll be like, oh, it's almost done. Now, Are they, the vegetables ready? Because I, I want to eat those now. And it's like, Whoa, Have they challenged great. you guys and asked you why we're doing this? Yeah, what, absolutely. How, what do you say to them? Why do we eat this way? And I say, well, we eat the foods in order of uh, importance in terms of our health. So vegetables are most important. So we want to make sure we eat those first. It's also good for digestion. It's going to get your, it makes the food move through you better, helps you absorb things better. Well, why do we eat the meat next? Well, meats typically contain the essential. And I, I, you know, here's the thing, like don't underestimate your kid's ability to understand things. Sometimes we talk to little kids like they're fucking babies all the time. We do baby talk. Mm -hmm. So I'll say uh, meat has the essential macronutrients that you need. And then I'll say, let me explain to you what those are. So I'll say there's three things that come in food, uh, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, but only two of them you have to eat, otherwise you won't survive. One of them you don't have to eat. Like if you never ate carbohydrates, you would still survive. That might not be ideal, but you won't survive. But two of them you have to eat or you won't survive, and meat contains both of those, and that's why that's next. And then the last thing is the non-essential thing that we need, but that can also be important because it can provide us with energy and this and that, which is our starches. And so they, oh, okay, that makes sense, and it's done. Yeah. And it's done. And I haven't had any like issues at the, because what would happen is if I started with like most dinner tables, we'll start with the starch and then they'll move to the meat and then they move to the vegetables. By the time you get to the vegetables, you're going to have to fucking fight with your kids. Yeah. And that yeah. is not, a, and that's not a situation you, you win. Even if you win, you don't win. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. If you have it all in one plate, it's just like going to sit there and they're going to stare at it until it gets cold. And then it's like this battle, you know, to try and get that out. No, I like that a lot. I have actually done something somewhat similar but uh definitely highlighting the importance of you know like what what meat does for you and like uh why like you only have like two you know essential macronutrients and so i have had that same conversation even with the four and you know a five-year-old and eight-year-old it's like they get it it's so great my daughter um went to the dentist the other day and she had a couple look like cavities are starting to, to, to develop so they they did some they put some sealants and my daughter by the way like is a is a uh, a grain fanatic, any grain, rice, yeah. wheat, like whatever. I partially blame. I'm not going to put the blame on anybody. It's you, you know, uh, I mean, in my culture, bread and pasta are such staples, and it's the first fucking thing you feed kids. And so she just ate those early on, along with other things too. But that's what she. And obviously, those foods are pleasurable to eat anyway. So she's super addicted to them, and she's getting some cavities. So she got some cavities, and she's asked me. She goes, "How come?" you know, how come my brother doesn't have as many cavities as I do? And, you know, do you have cavities? I said, well, actually, I've never had a cavity. And she's like, what? Why do I get a cavity? So I explained the microbiome of the mouth. 
I explain how certain foods can affect that. And I explain how grains and sugars in particular create an environment in your mouth where bacteria lives and then attacks your teeth. And I'm just being totally honest. I'm like, you know, so maybe I th- you getting more cavities because the microbiome in your mouth is is promoting this bacteria that and she's like, well, how do I change that? I said, well, it's complicated because again, I'm being honest with her. I said, but something you can try is try to avoid eating a lot of, uh, of, of grains. Well, what are grains? You know, cereal, uh, maybe pasta, as I said, try to avoid eating as many sugars in particular too. Like if you, if you want to eat candy and stuff like that, that tends to give cavities. She's like, okay. And I noticed very subtle changes in how she started eating because she's understanding the consequence of the cavity. Dude, what's crazy it's freaking is uh, awesome. most smart kids will, if you say something that they they don't understand, they'll say, what do you mean, Papa? Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. She'll, she'll probably say that right back uh-huh. to you if she doesn't understand something like that. If so she's engaged. I love, <laughs> Katrina yeah. used to, when I, when I first started dating her, Nathaniel was only five years old and he's a, he's a really intelligent kid. And uh, she'd always ask me, like, the conversations you have with him are so weird. She's like, I've never, and I'm like, I love to sit down with a young mind like that and see just how smart they are, and and make the, and digging into them, digging. Why did you say that to me? Where have you? Where did you learn that? And like, yeah. just keep at making them think and process. You'd be surprised how fucking smart Dude. kids are when oh, you yeah. take the time oh. to do that. You ever have a straight up conversation with one of your kids? Like just just a conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> it's so funny, right? Yeah, it feels really weird. But yeah, I have had a, a few of those conversations where you're talking to them like you're just talking to another adult yeah. almost, and <laughs> you kind of get lost in it. And you realize, you know, like they stay on course for a lot longer than I would have anticipated. Dude, and then it's just I, like- I think if you guys take, do a good good job of doing that, which you guys do, you guys do, I think that's going to pay off so much when they are teenagers because when shit does get hard, oh yeah, because you're they're used to communicating to their father, it's going to be that much easier for them to open up and share what they're going. You through. have to be honest. You by teach the way. that. We so all want to understand things, you know, yeah. and like why not start early? Like really give them a deep understanding of things. Why not? You five to seven is the most formative time for that yeah. brain. Uh, and you, you have to. Be, that's what, if you ever want to treat those, train those habits. That's when you. And you have train to be habits. so honest. Like don't demonize. Like, like I had a drug conversation with my Except 12-year-old. for Santa Claus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. We talked about uh, drugs. You know, my, my son's 12. And I figured, well, it's a good time to talk to him about drugs. He probably will be exposed to them within the next five years at some point, right? In high school. At some point, he's going he's gonna to come across them or at least hear people talking to him if it's not already happening. So I had this drug conversation with him. And I was fucking honest. Like, when, I, when anybody, when an adult talked to me about drugs when I was a kid, it was like, they're evil. They're terrible. They'll make you crazy. Yeah. You'll lose your mind. And, and I remember thinking like, yeah. I believed it. Like, oh, that's so true. Why would anybody want to yeah. do that? And then you get crazy. older and then you st- like experiment because you're going to fucking experiment and you drink a little alcohol and you're like, yeah, I like the way this feels. Yeah, it was nothing like that. What do you mean? I, this, <laughs> so I on it. So I, I was very honest and I told him, I said, you know, so he's like, why do people do these drugs? I'm like, because they feel good. The people like the way they feel. So let's be honest on both sides. And then he said, well, but they're bad too. I said, oh, absolutely. I said, they're te- they can be very bad for your body if they're used inappropriately. Many of the illegal ones, there really aren't a lot of proper uses. I said, however, and I talked about how heroin is a painkiller, how cocaine would use to numb things, how marijuana. And we went, but just be totally honest and do the same thing with food. Like don't demonize food. Like this is evil. Don't eat it. I'll be like, well, it tastes really good. Like they yeah. designed this to taste really, really good. And sometimes that's fun and that's okay. But here's why... Most of the time it isn't. And just be honest because once you, if your kids start to think that, oh shit, my dad's full of shit on these types of things, they start to throw it all out. You know, what, the, what do they call it? Baby with the bathwater. That's right. Yep. Radical honesty, huh, Justin? That's it, man. Coming in hot. Next question is from Jackie Martinez, 1983. Hey, Jackie. Jackie. It's our friend, Jackie. It's our girl. How do you guys weigh out huge decisions? What advice would you give someone facing a huge life decision? We arm wrestle. <laughs> so she has a major decision in the next couple of days regarding her living situation. So, well, what I do is I take a massive dose of ayahuasca and I ride the dragon. <laughs> <laughs> That's my go-to. That's my go-to. Is that how you learned it on it? Yeah. Do you uh, do you, you 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 listen to Aya? What do they call? Yeah. Yeah. Mother Aya. Yeah, Mother yeah. Aya. Uh, yeah. She tells you what to do. Yeah, it's very. That's revealing. your own. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, I I read something. Um, relatively recently over the, the past couple of years that I thought was absolutely brilliant. And that, uh, and it was really, it's one of those brilliant things I've put into practice and it's actually started working. So one of the, so there's studies that have been done on people to show that when people encounter a decision, typically their gut reaction 
will more often than not be the right decision. This is true with test taking. So when people take tests and then they find always questions, go with your first answer, and they don't yeah. <laughs> like it's like it's like it's like a majority of the time, not all the time, but a majority of the time that's a better answer. And I, I've seen the stats on it. It's yeah. like sixty or seventy percent of the time uh-huh. more. It's like your first your initial your, your initial guess is right. Mm. It is, and your gut. I mean, they talk about being your gut reaction. Your gut ha- is the second highest concentration of serotonin receptors in the body. It's where you produce most of your serotonin. Your heart is your third. So a lot of people say go with your heart. Well, that saying actually has some interesting. You know relevance because you do have the third, like I said, the third highest concentration of serotonin receptors are in the heart. So essentially, uh, you feel things in those areas because of information that's been processed. Hmm. Now, it doesn't mean you're consciously aware of them like you are because you don't have a frontal lobe in your stomach, but it does mean that you're kind of feeling what you're thinking and it's based off of information you've accumulated. It's still it's feedback. Not, it's not a guess. That's my point. My yeah. point is a gut feeling is not a guess. It's actually a decision or a direction of decision based on available information that you've already stored in your body. That's why it's more often than not correct. Now, the problem is when you encounter a tough decision is indecisiveness. What do I do? Second right. guessing. Mm-hmm. So I was reading this article where this guy was saying, get used to making decisions. And the way you start is by with small decisions. When you encounter small decisions, like you're talking to someone like, hey, guys, what do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. Just make a decision. All right, we're going to eat barbecue. Let's go. Start with small decisions, and then you start to become more confident with making decisions. And then when the big ones pop up, you know, like, you know, should I leave my job and do this or not? Like, you know, like, I'm going to do it. And when I was reading this article, I was thinking about it. I was like, wow, okay, I, I can really see how there's some truth to that, but it still feels scary. So I started to think about the people that I know who I've met through Mind Pump, who are very successful, who obviously seem to have made a lot of fucking good decisions or at least ended up right. And they all seem to be fast decision makers. Yeah. The one person who comes to mind was uh, Cena. Uh, what's his name? Joe uh, Decina. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Joe Decina from Spartan meets us and within 15 minutes, I want you guys podcasting at the next he one. He goes, leads right with his instinct. Yeah. And it's like, and the dude's obviously made a lot of, like, he's fucking kicked ass the entire time. And a lot of people I've met who are real successful yeah. tend to be that way. They're like, you know, I'm making that decision. I well, they've it. honed in on that decision-making process. And even Bedros, uh, when, we, when we interviewed him, he brought this up as part of the process of, like, really trying to refine, um, you know, being better at that. Like, I need to make all these little micro decisions constantly, and I need to get better at, at doing it, um, you know, at a, at a more rapid pace and, and being comfortable with it. So you can get the ones that, like, maybe I made the wrong decision there. You can get them out of the way, mm-hmm. and then you can correct that and, and sort of make micro tweaks as you go forward. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, the big ones are, are tough. You definitely have to consider all that feedback that you're going through, like the instinctual um, just, just feeling uh, towards that direction versus the other direction what does that feel like you know and then start to kind of play out like in your mind uh what that looks like and and just just go for it make that decision and, and stick with it I, I think that um i think it's important to think desired outcome like if i'm about to make a huge decision like let's say a career shift and this reminds me of what happened with katrina like god this was four years ago well four, god it's been about four years four years ago in our relationship. And we had just came off of a year of like not having to work. Like her and I for like a year didn't work and we traveled and just had fun and just really enjoyed each other. And at the time we were, Justin and I were working together and we were working on level up and stuff and mind pump hadn't started yet. And Katrina was talking about, you know, going back to work and, you know, we'd talk about it all the time. And I'm like, well, what do you want to do? You know, do you want to do this, that? And she goes, you know, I I've never, put myself and use my degree to get myself into a job. I've always done entrepreneurial stuff. Like she worked with her mom in the business, things like that. She's like, I've never really gone out and used my degree. So let's, let's find a job that requires that. And honestly, my desired outcome is that I just want to fucking make a lot, a lot of money right now. And I want to put some money away. I want to save, I want to get the house. Like, so that was like her mindset going into that. So that was before even looking for jobs or making a decision like that. She really, so now, you know, this is my goal, right? Yeah. So this, I mean, this is how this girl lands in fucking concrete. You know what I'm saying? Like Katrina didn't know anything about concrete yeah, and right. is now overseeing, you know, multi, multi million dollar projects and making a lot of money doing that. Like she didn't know anything about that. That wasn't the desired outcome. I didn't need to do something that was fulfilling and passionate or I, yeah. it, made, it made me this, but it did. It challenged her in ways. She had to learn so much. Sure. She had to grow like, and she's now on the executive team for this company. But I think that when you, when you think like, okay, 
uh, I'm about to switch over to this job. Like, I think a lot of times people don't really know why they're doing that. Sometimes they're just, they, they think they can get, like, I remember I dated this girl too, who I remember looking at her resume one time, I was helping her out and I'm going through and I'm like, I don't think we should list all this. And she's like, why? I work for all these. I was like, well, cause it shows like no loyalty. It looks like you, well, they paid me more and then they paid me more and they paid me. And it's like, yeah, but you just so you just keep what so it's all about making just a dollar more. Mm-hmm. So what, what do you don't enjoy your job? I'd rather make two dollars less if you know I, sure. I like my environment or it fulfills me a different way. So not really understanding their desired outcome. So you know if you're going in to make a decision, you might be taking a risk like where you're you might not make a lot of money. So but that's okay. Maybe what this is a, a career change for me. You know maybe like when I switched over to marijuana from cannabis, I had no desire. You mean to, from the gym. Yeah, from the gym. What did I say? From I marijuana from cannabis. Oh, yeah. So, sorry. <laughs> I used to be in the marijuana industry. Now, now I work in and cannabis. And then I got sophisticated. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> nice catch. It was weed and then it was cannabis. Thank God you know my story better than <laughs> me. Right? Yeah. So I remember that was at that point in my life. I, I loved the job I did. I had 401k. I had benefits. I was making good money. Um, I used to say that the only way you could get me to leave here is if you paid me at least double what I was. Because I'd have uh, clients always offer me these jobs that were a little bit more money than what I was. But I was like, I like what I, yeah. I love what I do. Like yeah. I don't want I don't want to leave that for just a, it's not enough. But I do remember someone sliding a piece of paper over to me and going like, "This is how much you're going to make in your first year," and it was significantly higher than anything I had ever even thought of yet at that time. And so that became a no brainer for yeah. me. The it desired was, outcome was okay. That's important. Yeah. Let's do that. yeah. And, yeah. I, and the way my thought process behind it was like, even if I hate this job, what about that? I, if I put my head down, be good at it, get you know, and do it, put enough money away, then it's going to set me up for other future potential things I could do. So desired outcome going into that situation to me and really, truly understanding what your desired mm-hmm. outcome is. And then Sal, you've said this before, and I think this is exactly how my brain works is then I think the desired outcome. Then I think, okay, what's the worst, absolute worst possible outcome that could happen? Sure. This? Yeah. I switch over. It's fucking miserable. I have a boss who just is, I hate working for all those things could potentially happen. Right. Yeah. So can I make, can I make myself be okay with, I just left this career or this thing to do this. And if you're like, well, okay, you could sleep. Yeah, I could handle that. Mm-hmm. I could yeah. bear that because worst case scenario, I'll just get out in a and year. Go back to I like right. that you almost make a list and you're sort of weighing it all out more measured. Well, because I, I know like some people can interpret feedback, you know, like, like as, and it's fear. It's something like more, it's more like they're listening to all these, um, these options and, uh, a lot of times fear will deter them from actually making the right decision. Right, right. And so, so I think what you guys were saying, I think, and this is where I think right now and where we're at, like, but I think you have to develop this skill to make quick decisions because yeah. quick decisions are, yeah, it, yeah, that's extremely, that takes a while, it yeah. takes, that's extremely important to be able to go like this, boom, let's do this. I need to do this. And, and but you have to learn to get comfortable with failing then, yeah. right? So, and I just talked about this the other day about yeah. how, you know, I got really okay with these fast decisions because I also got really okay with figuring out my desired outcome, figuring out the worst case scenario, accepting that that could be the possibility, doing it. Oh, there it is. That's okay. Boom, we're going. That's right. And and you have to, you know, when it comes to uh, being okay with failing, it's like it's really more. Really, you have to understand this. Regardless of the decisions you make, failures and challenges are going to hit you. So you're kind of guaranteed that those challenges and failures are going to hit you no matter what. So you got you got to you got to ask yourself. How do I reduce the amount of times that I uh, end up in a really, really bad situation, which doesn't have to be just be financial. It can be you know, an emotional situation. You can have a high paying job and be fucking miserable. I've had so many clients who made a shit ton of money in tech and hated their lives, were, were terrible health as a result of it and it destroyed their, their lives. Yep. And yeah, I know lots of people like that. So you have to ask yourself, which direction is going to is going to in- increase my growth and get me where I want to go faster and that's typically the faster de- the, the decisions where you feel them like okay you know what I'm going to go and I'm going to do that and it's usually the ones that have meaning for you but I do think we are there's a little bit of a, a a bias because we're all entrepreneurs and I think entrepreneurs naturally do that or at least they 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 value that oh, ability, that uh, autonomy. One hundred percent. That's why I had to wait for you guys were done to say, "Well, this is where I don't think a lot of people are at that level yeah. to make it just this decision quick, follow your gut." That's something that we've we've trained that skill. I think you need to learn to understand desired outcome first. Mm. You need to know what the fuck, why you even want to make that move, and then be at be at rest with the worst possible outcome and the best possible outcome. And the, and once you get 
that understanding, then I think you can start to harness this ability to like boom, boom, boom. Yeah, pop I think it. if you move forward with uh, integrity, so your goal is always to be a better person. So integrity and, and excuse me, integrity and competence. So I'm I'm going to try and be an honest, good person, or at least better than I was yesterday. And I'm going to try and become a better person in terms of my knowledge every single day, which improves your competency. And you're a hardworking person because you can't be lazy, right? If you have those three things and then you base your decisions off of those, much more often than not, the decisions you're going to make are going to progress you forward. You see what I'm saying? You're just going to play the odds. And the odds are, if you're honest and you're learning more every day and you work hard, you're probably generally going to trend towards a better outcome. Even if in, in between those, you're going to have some valleys where you're going to drop a little bit, where you you know boost back up. I mean, Mind Pump was is... is for us, I know, is the cum- accumulation of all the shit we did in the past. It all led here. And it, it didn't seem like it's all connected until you look backwards and go, oh, yeah, I wouldn't be here had it not been for all these other decisions I made. Yeah. And and I can honestly say this is the, the, the best position I've been in career-wise. And it's not pay. I made more money you know, I, I managing also, health clubs, you know, this, this is better because this is much more fulfilling and meaningful and at the potential is massive. I, I also want to make the point too, that what I started to put together early on was the scarier it was and the riskier it was, the greater the reward mm-hmm. and, and the greater the fulfillment Always. and greater the fulfillment Always. came from it. Fuck yeah, so man. when, when, if it's scary and it seems difficult and you don't want to do it, it's like, those are the, those are the ones that are fucking the easy decisions. Yeah. There's no, there's not those a lot of the fl- real rides right, waiting for you. Right. And that's, so, when you when you get that feeling, oh man, it, it reminds me of the butterfly feeling of playing sports. I mean, it's just, I it excites me. I get excited when I get that feeling inside. Like I was like, ooh, this is chal- this is challenging. Arnold like, Schwarzenegger. Uh, here's where growth comes. Schwarzenegger you know? had a quote once. It was so awesome. I'm, I don't I'm, I don't remember the exact quote, but it was something like, I love it when people tell me that something's never been done before. Oh yeah. Because then I realize that I can be the first one. Right. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, no one's ever done that before. And people are like, oh, you know what? You're right. I, I shouldn't even try. Whereas his mentality is, nobody's ever done that. Yeah. Fuck yeah, I want to be the first one. Yeah, right. First to how, market. How awesome is that mentality right there? Yeah, motivation is bullshit. Self-belief is everything. Excellent. Check it out. Go to your app store on your phone and get the Mind Pump Media app. It allows you to search for not just titles, but actual things we talk about within the podcast on the search function. It'll pull up all the podcasts. We've talked about that topic. And then you can really fine-tune your fitness knowledge, or at least how you learn your fitness knowledge. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.